I will call to order this meeting of April 26th um, at 6.01. Um, I will just read through our agenda for the evening, which we will begin with communications from the school committee and the administration. Then we will have the student representatives report, some action items, including consideration of acceptance of a WIFI grant, to WIFI grants, totaling $46,092, consideration of approval of nurse substitute pay adjustment through June 30th, 2022, public comment, and then an update on operation, on school operations from Andrew Marin, um, WPS student assessment overview, session one on formative assessments, followed by the chair report, superintendent report, future agenda items, and next meetings and an executive session and adjournment. Um, so we will just move straight into our communications. So first of all, um, we had received a report from the MCIEA, which um, we will add, it's either in your packet already or we will add it to the shared drive for you. Um, basically, it's, uh, it's a letter from the MCIEA management to updating Senator Lewis um, on this year with the MS M MCIEA, um, the release of these new s school quality measures dashboard, which will be made public to, which will be released publicly this spring. Um, and there is also some discussion in there about their goals for 2023 and some of their recommendations to Senator Lewis. Um, so please look for that. Um, Select Board had reached out regarding Article 18 on the sports court at the Mystic School. They will be providing some written background information through Dr. Hackett to us. And if members have questions that are specific to the article, then just please reach out to their chair, Rich Mucci, before Thursday so that those can be addressed. Um, we also have a memo from the Master Plan Implementation Committee. Uh, this is set up uh, by the Planning Board and was talked about last night by um, the Planning Board during their update. Um, it will be an advisory body. Um, and they are, they have added in school committee representation and they will need a school committee representative by May 9th, which is for a monthly meeting. Um, so I'm just putting the information out to you for a member to please volunteer to help with that. Um, we have kindergarten orientation across the district this Friday. so something exciting to look forward to and do we have any subcommittee updates yes mr brady thank you <coughs> so the finance subcommittee met and we had talked a little bit about the endowment so just a real quick update uh, i'm reaching out to uh, Cindy Boney, who's the administrative contact for the Winchester High School Alumni Association. And so I'll report back after I'm able to have a conversation with her. I just reached out to her this week, uh, given that the vacation was last week. And just on the kindergarten registration, can we tell people the times at some point? We don't have to do it right now, but just before the end of the meeting, just so we can tell them the different times for each school. Because I know it's 9 a.m. at Morocco on Friday, but... Okay. You have to go back into the application to find your time. That's the only way to find it. So. Okay. In your application to find the time for yeah. kindergarten I can orientation. Pull I can pull up the times in a minute. But okay. So All right. We can do that Or <laughs> we can see if there are any updates from anybody else or from Dr. Hackett. I yield my time. I don't have anything else. Um, I am expecting to receive information on the uh, sports court, and you'll have that probably by today, tonight. By tonight. Yep. Okay. And um, as you know, we are posted for a meeting on the 28th, which is Thursday um, at 6.30 uh, as an opportunity to get together. There were some conversations around the sports court, as already been alluded to, so um, just, prior, just prior to the uh, town meeting. And that's at the high school again? That's at the high school. 
same guidance counselor same area. Same guidance counselor uh, okay. conference room. Okay. Mr. Brady, did that give you a moment to find that? <laughs> um, unfortunately, the the file is not there again. So we had this about two hours ago, and we fixed it, and now it's missing again. So we'll get it. Uh, okay. Might take a little bit though. Okay. Find it. Okay. Um, let us see. So next we have our student representatives report. So I'd like to welcome our student representatives from the school student council tonight, L. O'Connor and Charlie Savage. We're so glad to have you again you. on a rainy day. <laughs> Also, just very thankful for all the report, the support that we have received in this initiative, and we appreciate all of your guys' help with publicizing this drive. We are also looking for your help to get the word out on another drive led by WHS students. From May 2nd to May 13th, please consider donating any used sporting equipment to Winchester Plays It Forward. They are looking for cleats of all kinds, basketball or <coughs> softball, gloves, bats, and helmets, lacrosse helmets and sticks, tennis rackets, golf clubs, and hockey equipment. So kind of everything out there. They will be distributing the gently used equipment to various national and international organizations, which includes cleats for kids, relaxed collections, Boys and Girls Club Massachusetts, and many more. There will be a drop-off bin at the front of the high school labeled Play It Forward. And you can also bring equipment to the Sons of Italy parking lot on May 14th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. And if you have any questions regarding this drive, please feel free to contact WinchesterPlaysItForward at gmail.com. We also want to mention that the U.S. News and World Report ranked the WHS as the 10th public school in Massachusetts in the top 600 in the country, which includes charters and test schools. So that is a huge achievement, so it's very exciting. And then shifting gears, the class of 2023 is selling May flowers throughout the month of April. Students can purchase a raindrop and flower to deliver a message to another student on Tuesday, May 17th. And this is always a great way for kids to write a fun message to their friends while also still supporting the class of 2023. And on the same thread, you may have noticed a number of tulip beds if you have driven by the high school. Um, last year, Charlie and I, along with several other WHS students, designed and taught a lesson plan for a number of fourth grade classrooms at all of the five elementary schools. And then we were able to plant tulip bulbs at the respective schools with a generous grant from WIFI. This year, we kind of switched things up a bit and had all the elementary school students plant just at the high school. So the colorful work that you can see outside of the high school growing is that of Winchester's very own elementary school students. Next week is also a time to appreciate everything that our teachers do for us. The WHS National Honor Society and the Parent Teacher Faculty, the Parent Faculty Association are currently working to organize a surprise for the WHS teachers and staff for Teacher Appreciation Week. This tradition began last year and they hope to just continue it throughout the coming years. Um, they're, all WHS students are invited to sign up to make a poster decoration for any of the staff members at the WHS, and then these posters will be hung up from May 3rd through the 6th for all to see during Teacher Appreciation Week. This is just an amazing way for our students to show their gratitude for our staff members with the use of a personalized poster. 
And we want to give a huge shout out to Mrs. Harrison for driving this initiative and for always acknowledging our wonderful staff. And then in the next coming weeks, we also hope to see another student council project play out. The mental health committee has been in the process of designing a safe space and relaxation room for students at the WHS. We received two grants to make this possible, one from Social Capital Inc. and the other from the PFA. We plan on ordering all of the furniture by the end of this week and hope to complete the room in the next coming weeks. So if you have any suggestions or questions about the rooms, please feel free to let us know. All right, picking up on the mental health note, uh, we had the second half of the spring mental health series presentation. Uh, throughout the month of May, which is Mental Health Awareness Month, the school has partnered up with the Winchester Coalition for a Safer Community to shed more light on issues surrounding mental health. Uh, to start off, they held an assembly for all juniors during wind block before April break. This was run by Miss Haynes, uh, and it went over the story of Mad runner Madison Holleran, uh, who struggled with mental health and ultimately took her own life. Um, the oh, sorry, <laughs> lost my place. Miss Haynes, along with other teachers, provided information on places where students can find help and how to deal with issues like these. The second part took place today, which featured WHS alumni, uh, college mental health workers, and even a stand-up comedian. Uh, and both assemblies went really smoothly and provided lots of helpful information to students who may be struggling with issues like this. Moving forward, the music department is having their auditions for ensemble classes, and the freshman's dance is this Friday. Uh, I believe there's also a parents gathering uh, before this event in Lucia's. For a little personal shout out, there's a boys and girls tennis fundraiser on May 1st uh, at the Winchester Indoor Lawn and Tennis Center, Building 2. This will be on course 13 and 14. Uh, they'll be raffling off lessons, free stringing, uh, and more. So please come out and support. Moving on, things continue to be busy for juniors, uh, as we will soon be meeting with guidance counselors for, I believe, the third organized event this year, uh, including trying to finalize as many courses as possible and really just going over end-of-the-year happenings. Uh, to follow up with this, juniors have a meeting next Wednesday, May the 5th, to plan for next year's Spanish exchange program. This will mark the 10th annual time that WHS has collaborated, or maybe not annual, the 10th time that WHS has collaborated with uh, IES Marquez de Suanes. Sorry for my pronunciation, I take Italian. <laughs> um, and they'll be taking approximately 30 students. Um, so now for one of our focus questions for tonight's report, which is students' feelings during, before, and after spring break. Students were definitely very excited for spring break, as we always are, and it came at just a great time. Some students spent their break on vacation, others were relaxing at home, some were attending practices for the spring sports, while others were preparing for their AP tests. Two of our very own teachers, Ms. Bouchane and Ms. Keene, ran the Boston Marathon over break, and they were surprised by several WHS students cheering them on along the course. Um, and now that students have returned to school, we are looking forward to the warm weather and the other spring festivities. Some 11th and 12th graders will be taking AP exams, which will begin starting next week. Many 12th graders are also looking forward to these senior activities that they have coming up, which leads us to one of our other focus questions, which is senior events. The first event is the Senior Sunset, which is a class dinner on May 26th. This will be followed by our senior traditions of returning to their old elementary schools dressed in their cap and gowns on May 27th. And this is the first time that this has been able to happen since 2019. So it is very exciting. And then students will have their prom on June 1st. It will be hosted in the same style as was our Dean of Students, Miss Paradise, meaning it will be on the field under the tents and lights with many food trucks. Students will then have their graduation on June 3rd, and we are hoping for great weather so students can parade through town and then celebrate at Knowlton Stadium at McCall Middle School. There will also be yearbook signings, class gifts, and a special countdown for our seniors designed by Mr. Mahoney. Senior parents have purchased banners for their students, which will be delivered to the graduating class starting this week. And this Sunday, there will be a surprise delivered to each of our seniors from the Coalition for Saver Community and the WHS PFA. 
because this Sunday marks May 1st, which is otherwise known as Decision Day. So this surprise is to celebrate all of our seniors' decisions in their future endeavors, which may include enrolling in the military, work, college, or anything else. And these events are always just such an awesome tribute to our seniors and exciting way to celebrate all of their accomplishments. <coughs> all right, and for a quick uh, update on masking, everything once again appears to be going well. There's not been, at least by students, a noticeable increase uh, since break of cases uh, and the sense of respect revolving around those who continue to choose wearing a mask seems to remain strong. Some things that we as students have noticed is an increase in use of the dining hall now that the dividers are down and students can see each other. There seems to also be an increase in seating uh, since the mandate has dropped, which I believe is beneficial as it allows more students to include people who might not have been able to fit at the table earlier in their lunches. Um, we'll continue to update on our return to normalcy and we're currently working on the survey that we mentioned last week to get more student feedback about how they feel about demasking. Thank you. Any questions, please ask. I had a question ask for you. <clears throat> I appreciated you bringing up the US News and World Report ranking and then you mentioned the AP exams are coming up. So I don't know how much you dove into the data, but the first data point about the high school in that ranking is the percentage of students who took one AP exam. And so currently it's 60% at Winchester High. And I'd just be curious as to what you think about that and why you think it's 60% and if you think that's a good number or if you think that's something that we should look at in terms of, you know, because 58% pass at least one. So basically everyone who takes one passes one, but that leaves the question, why do 40% of students not even take one? Um, it, like just like, um, I, I think like some students don't take an AP class, but then also I know that some colleges don't accept AP credit. So if you take it senior year, students may be less inclined to take the test if they know that their school that they'll be attending won't accept that credit. That's just kind of my guess on that. I would say that almost all students who take APs end up taking the exams. Um, there's definitely, you know, the competitive environment in Winchester High School, which like strives for higher education. So I think a lot of students do feel that they should be taking APs. And then again, you have issues with class sizing, especially with COVID. So this year, it might have dropped a little bit. But I think overall, students are motivated to take APs. And when they're in that class, they're motivated to succeed. Thank you. Can I just give a shout out real quick to that, though? Because um, I happen to have a senior right now who chose to take honors classes over AP classes because of the extraordinary number of honors classes that are taught at the high school. And sometimes it was a really tough, tough choice for her to choose an AP or an honors class. And given that many of the colleges, like you said, aren't accepting the AP classes anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I, just, I just wanted to give a shout out to the curriculum directors and departments at the high school for offering extraordinary choices for um, classes that cover AP material, but those that um, APs just can't get to or can't cover. So I just wanted to mention that as part of that too, because I'm not sure US News measures that very well. Other questions, Mr. Nixon? Okay, back to your personal <coughs> shout out on tennis. Um, so I'm just curious, tell, tell us a little bit about when you're fundraising, whether it's for tennis or any fundraisers you're aware of for the spring, what are some of the kinds of things that students are fundraising for? Is it primarily swag and sort of end of year banquets so far as you know? So far as I know, for tennis, we're doing it mostly so we can like continue buying gear for the seasons to come. You know, it's, it is expensive, and without fundraising, it's like you got to personally fund it, which is definitely like taxing. Um, but then again, you have some teams, especially like, the larger teams, that will do like donations, mm -hmm. and then obviously like student council when we do fundraisers, most of it's for donations. So it really depends on the size of the team. I'd say I think the majority of it would be going towards buying like gear for the team yeah I would agree and like the end of year banquets yeah, yeah the banquets. so the, re the reason I ask is we, we found ourselves in a situation around 2016 I think where <clears throat> we had really kind of reached this a, a, a tipping point with athletics we had a bit of a structural deficit we had at one point some 
kids playing baseball that were fundraising for baseballs, you know, um, and there was just a philosophy that there's some essentials we really need to provide. So the Winchester Sports Foundation was huge, that they basically stepped up and matched us, that if we could rally and get FinCom support to kind of close that gap, the Sports Foundation matched that. Um, but athletics is sometimes when we talk about budget is, is sometimes not always front and center. So I'm always interested in sort of what fundraising is up to and where the money is going because as we continue to become a bigger and bigger district, we don't always think of athletics. It tends to be a second, third, or you know, fourth thought. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I hope that fundraising is really going for some of those sort of extra things that make the year special, whether it's, you know, a hoodie, some of the swag, end of year banquet, and so forth, and that we're not asking kids to fundraise for the things that are, frankly, just sort of essential for the sport. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. Thank Good you. luck with the fundraiser. Thank you. Mr. Hopcroft. Yeah, I guess I'll chime in. First, um, thank you. I, I always appreciate your reports um, you know, coming here and helping us you know, have sort of a eyes on the ground view of, what, of what's going on, which is very helpful. Um, I'm also really intrigued um, by, by the survey and, and obviously of, of the, the demasking issue. And, and, and I guess as I was thinking about it, I was trying to think of you know, what would be the most meaningful um, things to ask. And, and so I put back <coughs> to sort of a challenge to think about that. Um, you know, certainly on the surface, you know, do people want to wear masks or not want to wear masks is, is you know, one um, level of inquiry you could get into. But given that I think most people probably don't want to wear masks and, and there are some people who may have more of a need to wear masks, there may be some questions you might consider um, in, in, your, in your survey around um, you know, what we can do to help those who need to wear them be more comfortable or, or other things. So just, I, I don't, I, I don't want to design a survey or anything, but just um, thinking about what, what your, your end result will be because, um, you know, 80% of the students don't want to wear masks is one, one output, but, you know, 80% of the students think this is a good strategy for helping make the other 20% feel more comfortable might be another a deeper layer of stuff. So I, I just put it out there to, to think about. Um, but, I'm, but I love the fact that you're doing the surveys and, and, and bringing the, the student input back. Yeah, we could definitely do that because I know like just like from like a general overview, like it seems like everybody's like felt pretty comfortable with the demasking or like felt like they have been respected. So it'd be interesting to see like what individual people think. Yeah, thank you. I was just wondering how you're delivering the shoes to the Dominican Republic. Is there a Oh, um, <coughs> two of the WHS alumni, Abby and David Joseph, they are part of the JC Hispaniola Fund, and they go on this service trip. I think it's, okay. and then like it's at the end of this month, I think, or maybe the beginning of next month. But they um, will take a couple of boats, or they'll fly anything else, like any other equipment that didn't make it on the boats, and then they'll deliver them to the villages, like by hand. Wow, that's really amazing. Yeah. Um, oh, and then you had mentioned the the graduation banners. Uh, yes. And are, are, is there like a seeking volunteers for delivering those or? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I know, I believe it's the PFA who's working PFA. on them. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think there have been volunteers in the past because I remember people coming around when my brother was graduating and like doing it. I'm not sure if they're repeating it again, but we'll definitely mm -hmm. look into that. Yeah. Oh, it's not a request. I was just curious. <laughs> so. Parents had to purchase them through the PFA. Yeah. So oh, okay. not okay. every student necessarily will have a banner either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Any other questions? So, well, as always, thank you so much for coming and <laughs> reporting to us. It's always interesting to hear what you, what's going on in the schools. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. Have a good evening. Good, good night. Thank thank you. You. Yeah, that's right. Let's see. Okay. So, next up, we will actually shift to action items, and we will begin with consideration of acceptance of the WIFI grants. So we have uh, Ms. Karen Connolly tonight, the Executive Director of WIFI, uh, who can introduce the grants to us. Thank you so much. 
Um, it's always a hard act to follow the students because mm -hmm. they are so enthusiastic. And I was really excited to hear Elle talk about how they've continued that grant we gave them. You know, some of the most impactful WIFI grants, and I do hate that word, but some of the <laughs> WIFI grants that seem to influence the most people are not always the most expensive. And that was, you know, a group of students during the pandemic that thought it would be wonderful to spread joy and to work with other students and simply purchase tulip bulbs and plant them. And, you know, what fun is that? That's, I think that was an awesome thing. So, um, so this latest round of grants, which is the third we're presenting this year, totals a little more than $46,000. And these are grants that, for those of you that have been on the school committee for a while, are certainly very familiar to you. So returning to Teachers as Scholars, um, which is a program that WIFI has supported now for two decades. I think it's become refined over the last few years, and they're increasing offerings that seem to be a little more relevant to the needs of some of our teachers. We have this year um, added in the grant the stipulation that teachers um, look within their area of course content for the first classes that they sign up for. Um, this National Association for Music Education Conference is kind of exciting because of the number of teachers that are able to go and the fact that music educators don't often ask for support. And I think the fact that there's going to be, I guess it's a grouping of different associations all having their conference at the same time, really gives them a lot to consider. So that's very exciting. And of course, and I'm just kind of pulling out some of these, and then um, WFEE has now taken over full funding of AuthorFest. And I am very happy to report that the Winchester Cooperative Bank is continuing as a sponsor of AuthorFest, which means we will have some funds above and beyond what WIFI um, fundraises for to add to it. So AuthorFest is October 6th in person, God willing, <laughs> should, there, should there be nothing happen between now and October 6th. So um, we're excited about that. So I looked back a little bit, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, about what we actually did pledge this year. And so it was $102,000. Um, we are starting to see some grants also that were given at the beginning of the pandemic and then went on hold. We're starting to see them come to fruition. So we had purchased virtual reality devices, you might recall at the middle school, and they've actually trained with those. And on Friday, I'm going to the middle school to see a virtual tour of music festivals in Europe. So how cool is that? Cool. Um, and today I was at Morocco Elementary School where uh, Julie McElhaney Gorman and two of the other educators we sent to the Joe Bowler workshop were working with the kids on mindset mathematics. Always so impressive to see the students. They were, as ever, far smarter than I am and far more able to puzzle out what was being discussed. Um, the other, another one that was a big grant that's been a while in coming is at the high school, the 3D printer that we supported, which Craig McKenzie is physically building. Mm. I guess I, in my mind, thought it came in a box and you plugged it in, <laughs> and it does not. It comes in many, many little boxes, and Craig has had the assistance of several students, and they are in the process of finishing it up, but it appears to work, so that's, that's kind of exciting. So that's just the quick kind of overview. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or if you have any other comments on things that you'd like to see WIFI working on. Um, we are continuing to work. Mr. Nixon. Two quick questions. Um, so with respect to the data analysis grant, that's $625, can you share with us a little more of what Scott Spencer is looking to analyze? Or does he know yet? Will he be surveying McCall eighth graders, or is it about taking information we already have somewhere? I think it's about both, um, because he was involved with the this past year's bringing freshman students in. So I think he saw there was a lot of data there, but he wasn't quite sure how it all came together. Mm -hmm. So he plans to use this to analyze this current year's information, incoming information, and then he also indicated he'll be using it in the classes that he actually teaches. Hmm. So I'm curious because you know, we like to think of ourselves as data-driven school committee, data-driven mm -hmm. town. I'd be really interested in learning more about this once it kind of gets implemented, about what, what was analyzed and what the outcomes were. And I know that grant recipients, as a course, always come back to you and kind of share the results. That would be something I'd be really interested in 
and hearing more about, and particularly if it leads to something else moving forward for his colleagues or something on a more permanent basis. And then I just had a very, just a more general question for you, Karen. My memory is that during the pandemic, we had some educators that were participating in some virtual conference options. Um, I don't know if any of those were funded specifically through WIFI, but do you know if now that we're on the backside of the pandemic, are there options for educators that um, have sort of materially changed for better or for worse um, because of COVID? Are there some things maybe that are available virtually that just weren't before? Well, so the course that Dr. Spencer is taking is virtual. Okay. Um, teachers as scholars did a lot of virtual work last year, although our educators did not feel that that particular type of professional development was something they wanted to do virtually. You know, I think a lot of people are very tired of virtual. And I think a lot of educators, at least what I hear from them, and you may hear different or you may hear more, feel like if they're going to be doing PD, they want to be doing it in person and they want to have some of those contacts. Um, we were not sure that the folks that went out to California to do the Joe Bowler training were going to be interested in going. They indicated they really wanted to do that in person. <coughs> and Stanford went ahead with, with an in-person seminar. So I think people are starting to move back. But, you know, it's an interesting question, Chris, because as we're looking at AuthorFest, many of the people that we were able to have in the last two years, we hadn't had before because they live in other places. Mm -hmm. um, and we've talked about a hybrid AuthorFest. And I got to tell you, I don't love that idea. And Newton just did their AuthorFest, which they actually model on us. And they found some blowback because um, schools that had the auth authors that were virtual, the students weren't as engaged as the ones that had the authors who were in person. Mm -hmm. Of course, it gives you the chance to bring some folks that otherwise you could never begin to afford. But I think some of them are now asking as much for a virtual presentation that there was an author that the middle school was interested in that wanted um, $5,000 for a virtual presentation. Mm -hmm. That's not Chuck I'm writing. <laughs> um, you can you can look them up on YouTube. So, interesting question. I don't know. We'll see what happens over the over you know the coming time. I think shorter conferences, short seminars, I think are great to do as virtual. Some of these longer courses, I bet, are really hard for the teachers. So we've asked Charlie and Elle to talk to their peers about lessons learned through COVID, and are there some things that they experienced because of COVID that? all things being equal were, you know, were actually were better that they'd like to see continued. It's sort of a lessons. What are some things we can do institutionally? Um, so we've heard from them sort of from the student perspective. Um, and so that was kind of the basis of my question. I'm mm -hmm. thinking more about PD and the world of PD and are there opportunities maybe that are opening up that we didn't have before. So, but I, I get it. I mean, it, PD, I can appreciate when you say wanting to be in person and and the contacts piece is certainly important because it's not just about what you learn in the room and at the conference, right? But it's about the relationships right. that you make and a contact that you have to draw on later on. Um, so that's very interesting. Thank you. Appreciate it. I just want to say thank you, as always, for um, being thoughtful both in your board's approach to um, the grants that you're able to fund for us and your collaboration with the school district um, that we're all working towards sort of the same goals and um, creating experiences both for the teachers and the kids through the WIFI projects and like I, I thought the same thing when Al came in and I thought well that's I, I know one of the things missions WIFI has is that often you like to see projects and then you like to see them continue on beyond your initial funding and I think that's true of the small things as well as the, the bigger projects as well. So, and thank you for bringing Author Fest back. I know that was has always been a favorite of my kids, and it's um, there's just such an incredible experience, like you said, of getting to meet the person face to face and have a conversation with a real live author in the room, and then to be able to see yourself as a real live author too. So, I yeah, I'm I'm excited about that, and I do hope that we can afford some of those people who we had virtually, that I can convince them to come and not charge me too much. I have to echo that um, Author Fest is such a special event, and I've just lo I've loved it over the years. <coughs> Excuse me, um, just seeing how the kids interact with the authors, um, as you were saying, seeing themselves as authors, just being able to talk with them, 
and find out um, some of their motivations, like when they were kids. Oh well, <laughs> this is I, th- how they how they developed. <laughs> so I think that's very inspirational to kids. So we thank you. Chris asked about how things changed during the pandemic. One of the things that since we had to bring the authors virtually, I worked much more closely with the librarians Mm -hmm. on scheduling issues, but also on who they loved. And I think that um, that was a very good lesson and has brought WIFI back a little bit closer to the educators with who we book. So instead of just booking folks that we've gotten to know and we see, I'm hearing more from librarians and from educators what they can provide that's really within the realm of it's not just that it's cool to see an author but for instance we had a second grade author who tailored her whole presentation to the subject of revision which they were just coming into Mm -hmm. and it was really cool to see everything that she said just hit and the teachers were so excited about that and I think you know teachers have a lot they have to get done and giving up even just an hour can be difficult for them. They're Mm -hmm. far more interested and don't see it as giving up the time, but see it as supporting the time if those folks are are really kind of falling in line. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, yeah, I, you know, if they just wanted to pay me to do Author Fest, I'd do that. (laughs) (laughs) Not that there aren't other things. And on that one subject, um, we do have the Town Day Road Race coming up. I was I was just about to comment that as <laughs> I I believe the only committee member to run the fall race though correct me if I'm wrong I would certainly encourage folks to run in your race unfortunately I think I have a prior commitment but I'm willing to say I will sponsor any member or superintendent that will <laughs> run in the race so I'm putting awesome. that out there and uh, we'll just see I was just going to say, putting I was, walking, yep. walking, walking also, isn't optional for me. So. Walking, walking is definitely a possibility. <laughs> Absolutely. We, that's what we say, walk or run. But if, donate a child to it. If I'm there, <laughs> if I'm available, I will certainly run it again. Excellent. Um, so, yes, and we will, as always, have the Teachers on the Run shirt, which we will include administrators on the run or school committee members on the run um and and that is coming up and we also will be doing again um for teacher tribute flocking our schools with love the flamingos are too popular to not bring them back so the flamingos will be returning and i hope we have even more flamingos although i'm not sure that i have room to store more flamingos in my office but so there's a positive COVID legacy there actually is. I mean, I think what people did find was yeah. there was an element of creativity that we all had to come up with. And so teacher tribute had been done for 20 years, and I think it, people didn't, couldn't wrap their heads around it anymore, and they weren't excited about it. They understood the concept of a physical flamingo sitting in front of the school surrounded by 150 other flamingos tells everybody we're all a flock. We love each other. This is great. And, you know, I think it was very fun when educators came to school that last day and saw all the flamingos. So look for more. And we did have central office flamingos. You, you weren't they here. Were fr- no, there were some left over when I got here. And that's so. right. They were. I knew they weren't for me, but I did appreciate them. <laughs> well, who knows? We might have uh, sponsor a superintendent flamingo would be our next, well, our next yeah. option. We'll get well, away. I was going to say, if, <laughs> if you do a fall event, which I hope you will, I'd, I much look forward to playing blackjack with Lori and Frank. So <laughs> if you can make that happen, I'd be happy to be there for well, that. Well, that's the next thing. I'm, I'm still hoping to get through a few things before we get to that. So thank you. Um, and again, any other questions? We, we are still working right now with central office um, on a potential grant for um, the summer and fall. So hopefully... That will continue to unfold, um, but we don't have a specific grant deadline for the rest of this school year. So this should be it for this academic year, and then we will have fall grants as well. Um, but if something comes together before that, you'll hear about it. That's Thank awesome. you. Thank you so much, Karen, and to the board of Withy. That's just amazing. Happy to make a motion yes. to accept with gratitude from the Winchester Foundation for Educational Excellence, Educational and Professional Development Grants totaling $46,092. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Well, thank you, and enjoy the rest of your meeting, and see you all at uh, town meeting. That's right. Okay.
Uh, next on our agenda, we have consideration of approval of the nurse substitute pay adjustment through June 30th, 2022. Uh, we have reviewed this once before with Ms. Kirby, and now we are, I, if you have some further comment or if there are further questions, otherwise we are just coming back for a vote on this. I'd make a motion to approve it and to go forward with it. Second. Is that a second? Yeah. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, second. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, where did yep. that come from? Okay. Um, thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Nixon? Okay. I just wanted to clarify that the backup document was for much more than nursing. I just want to be sure that the motion was as detailed as you needed it for what we're trying to do. Yes. Okay. Yes. Based on last meeting. Okay. We'll thread the needle. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And next we will move into public comment. Um, I will just read our preamble, which is public comment shall be for a period of 20 minutes. It is not a discussion, debate, or dialogue between individuals and the committee. It is a citizen's opportunity to express their opinion on issues on the agenda or of school committee business. Any individual wishing to speak before the committee shall identify themselves by name and address and shall speak for no longer than three minutes. All individuals shall speak to the full committee through the chair and shall not address individual members or administrators. Uh, we offer in-person public comment with a sign in, sign up on a clipboard, or we also offer remote public comment with registration 24 hours in advance. Um, and I know that we have one registrant for remote public comment, and we just ask that you turn on your cameras and please give your name and address, which... Uh, we also have an in-person. I guess. Okay. And we'll start <laughs> we'll start remotely today you please Ms. <laughs> Popdak you are live hold on just a second wait 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 I gotta turn my volume up this is too much technology for me to handle okay can you hear me I can hear you okay. can you hear me we can hear you okay um good evening I'm Amy Poftak Mystic Valley Parkway um, I saw that formative assessments are on the agenda um, and wanted to voice my support for publicly sharing the Dibbles literacy data. I think it's great that the district has implemented Dibbles, which serves as a screener for risk factors for dyslexia and also as a formative assessment for K through two students throughout the year. As you know, there have been many concerns about early identification and intervention in the district. Prior to this year, the district did not have a dyslexia screener, and it was not using a valid and reliable assessment to measure students' early literacy skills. As a result, there are countless Winchester students who were not identified early and whose parents were never informed that their, that the, their students who struggled with reading might be at risk for dyslexia. We know this because of the data we have to date on special education identifications, and we know this because of the many dozens of parents who have come forward to share their experiences. We keep hearing about Dibbles and about how important this data is in driving decisions. In the recent school committee debate, Ms. Bolognier said, our district has incorporated a screener and is working on collecting data so that we can understand growth over time and the trends over time. In the announcement of Dr. Hackett's permanent appointment to superintendent, it said that he focuses on making data-driven decisions. I'm here tonight to advocate for sharing this data. Number one, I believe there should be transparency with the community about how the district is improving its ability to identify struggling learners as early as possible. And this is a goal that Dr. Hackett himself stated in his December digest. I believe it's also, number two, I believe it's important to see the progress the district is making toward teaching critical foundational literacy skills, skills that were not previously measured using a valid and reliable assessment such as Dibbles. So in short, I urge you as school committee members to ask for the data to be shared publicly. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Okay. And next, we have our in-person public comment. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks for joining us this evening. Good evening, uh, school committee. My name is Nick Cacholfi. I'm the recreation director for the town of Winchester. Um, I appreciate you taking a couple minutes out of your time to listen. Um, what I wanted to address is um, the project that we will be uh, presenting at town meeting, the, the Mystic Sport Court. Um, one of the things I want to talk about today really you know, quickly is twofold. One is I'm here to, to uh, apologize that I didn't get the information to the school committee in a timely fashion. Um, as a new uh, department head, my first time through this, um, I, uh, I failed to make the proper uh, communication to the, to the school board and, and by no means was that a, uh, a slight to the committee. I have a lot of respect for the school board and what we do here in Winchester and uh, I, you know, my goal when I came here is to create um, a better communication with the schools and be partners um, and I'm going to continue to try to do a better job at that. So for that I sincerely apologize. I did um, send out a, a complete packet um, today to Dr. Hackett for your review. Um, I kindly ask that you know you take a look at it and if there's any questions or concerns on it um, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm very transparent on what I'm trying to do at the rec department and uh, I, I, I do want to, to make a couple of comments about the actual project just so that I can uh, at least get some things out in, in the open. Um, I think uh, the most important thing for me is to um, support the programs that I already have and that, that I supervise and the staff that I supervise down at Mystic School. Um, the pandemic was an unbelievable um, detriment to the, to the recreation department being an enterprise account. I quickly learned in Winchester that um, the amount of pressure on the rec department to raise revenue is, is very high. Um, pandemic really hurt us and it continues to hurt us as we have uh, less access to facilities we typically would have. Uh, additionally, you know, coming back from uh, the, the, the hybrid model, our childcare, which is, for lack of better terms, our cash cow, um, is, uh, is still not at uh, pre-pandemic levels. In fact, we're about 20% under what our, our typical revenue would be. Our reven at the end of the day, our, uh, our expenses and our, our overhead doesn't shrink just because our revenue has. So for, for me, I have to be very creative in making sure that our, our current level of programming is still attractive. And, and for those of you that have been to Mystic School, you do understand that there ha there, it's a little long in the tooth. Um, it, it needs a little bit of sprucing up. And so my idea is, is first and foremost, is, is not how do I create more revenue and more programming on that facility. It's more is how do I make our childcare more attractive and keep it um, keep it within striking distance and keep it competitive with all the other uh, producers of childcare and other options that kids have in town. Um, I, I, you know, I really am in here to, to support the staff that have been here, many for 20 plus years, to continue to make sure that we're offering high level programs that um, are competitive with what else is in town. And my, my first and foremost thing with this is to basically repurpose an already existing basketball court and just make it a better opportunity for our child care program. Um, I think in, in the pitches and in, 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 in some of the meetings I've had and, and, and uh, presentations, we've, we've rolled out um, how much revenue could possibly be made on this because as I said, revenue is an important part of the recreation department. Um, but the way I look at it is if I can continue to make a better environment within the programs that we already have and the things that we're already offering at Mystic, and I can create a better um, attractive piece that people are going to gravitate to, then the revenue is going to be in our increased registrations in those programs. And that's what I'm, I'm really, my, my goal is, is to give the kids what they deserve. The same kids that, you know, the schools are servicing, and we're, we're getting the same kids from five different schools, and we also have our preschool in our Richmond program. So I'm, I'm trying to make sure the kids that are in our program have a safe, valuable place to play every single day after school. And I, I think that's that's why I'm up, you know, more upset with myself for not being able to have a proper presentation to this committee. Uh, but I would like to, uh, to again, um, ask for, uh, you know, sorry that I didn't bring that to you in a proper time, but I did want to at least address what the intention of this uh, this project is that is being brought to uh, to town meeting um, either Thursday or next Thursday, depending on how we get through it. Again, I, I, I I'm very transparent. I'm open. I've, I've been taking you know several calls from from people, and 
Uh, people have stopped in to ask about it. If there's any issue or if there's anything that you see on there that you'd like to discuss further, please feel free to reach out. Um, and, and again, uh, uh, you know, we really, really are excited about the potential of this. The kids, we really can't really play on that that dilapidated uh, tar facility, and we need something for the kids that and that and they and they deserve it. Nick, so. just so you know, um, the committee will have the the information. In fact, they I forwarded it earlier today, well, not too long ago. So they I've all they also have your contact information. <coughs> I'm sure some of them might take you up on your offer to reach out to you directly and ask questions that they have. And the committee has posted for a meeting on this Thursday at 6:30. So. Um, and it partially the intent is to talk about articles on the warrant i would i would anticipate this would be one of them okay so, okay i appreciate that absolutely thank you for thank your you. time tonight thanks Can I make one suggestion you, Nick. yes I make a, yes a, Mr. I, it's a personal request um we have a disability access commission as you probably know um and there was a private group that was seeking to make some improvements to the basketball courts at the very corner of manchester field in memory of uh, bob bigelow with a shade structure and so forth um, and so they met with the DAC just to ensure there was an accessible route uh, to that place because um, somebody in a wheelchair, for instance, can go out and shoot hoops if they want to. Um, in the situation at Mystic, it's pretty challenging because of the existing grade. So, and your, your drawings do show you've got steps from the building down there. But you do have kind of a, it looks like a secondary path to some sort of asphalt apron. So I would ask you to think about um, from a programming point of view. So if you had a student that, you know, had a mobility disability, how can they get access to this? And I think it would be smart for you to reach out to the DAC chair and share this with her. Her name is Lisa Matrandola. Um, and, and have that conversation um, because we, we frequently kind of look to the DAC just to be sure that sometimes we don't do a good thing badly. I mean, we want to make an investment and make an amenity for the town. And then some years later, a consultant comes by and says, that's an ADA violation. So we just want to be sure we're thinking of everybody in this respect. And, you know, ADA is civil rights law. So we, we want to be sure we're, we're mindful of that as well. I'd appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay, with that, I will close public comment and we will move on to the first order of business, which is update on school operations from our senior. Oh, yes. Sorry, that I have true. the kindergarten can, times. I, I don't know to, if you want them now or later. I was going to say for, um, yeah. for the end okay. during the chair Perfect. report. Madam yeah. Chair, you got ahead of me a little bit. Can, could I um, make a recommendation that uh, we take the assessment presentation out of order and move Nick, uh, move, thanks, hey Nick, uh, <laughs> move Andrew to afterward. We will uh, teach you here a little bit later. Yes, with okay consensus, with yep. we yep. should do that. Okay, thank you very much. So instead, we will move straight to the um, student assessment overview, session one on formative assessments. And welcome to our teachers. And Dr. Ellen Emma will kick us off. Thank you. Um, so I feel a little bit like we're PBS or BBC here. This will be a four-part series. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm going to give just a little overview at the beginning and go through kind of our big picture. And then tonight we'll focus in on one area. And we have some stars here to share about that. Um, but along the way, if there's any questions or anything you um, want to talk about, feel free. And when I'm done, maybe a couple of you could come up. But it's, I'll put my laptop over here so you can also see it when you're here. <laughs> Um, so when we think kind of big picture assessment as a district, because we, we have a group of all leadership that meets together at least once a month and then, you know, during the summer. And then we also have kind of the curriculum focused roles that meet together regularly, kind of K-12, pre-K-12 involved sometimes. So the two big things we really try to think about with assessments is what makes it meaningful and what makes it effective. Um, and one of the things that we always think about is any research, right, that you have to have multiple data points. They talk about triangulating your data so you have a good picture. So what our presentations will really yield is you'll be able to see those many, many data points um, that we look at. But that's what we try to look at as a big group. Um, and whenever we're designing our work, our big picture always is beginning with the end in mind for the students, which is 
how, you know, what standards and what skills do we want them to master both in their content and SEL and the things that we're working in. And then our, our measurement of that or our assessment of that is really not so much about their score, but what do we need to adjust? What do we need to change? What do they need? How do we constantly use that um, as constantly informing our next steps of our process? Um, and then <laughs> the thing that's really so hard is because we always want to just be able to measure this as well as we can is just to keep reminding ourselves so much of what we do, it's, that's why teaching is not you know, it's an art and a science because it's just complicated and complex and different things work for different students. So again, those multiple data points really help us build a profile of student strengths and next steps um, for the students, as well as our staff, because that also informs our PD. Um, and then thinking about a couple of things that, mm, what assessments can we best utilize so that they don't take time away from teaching? So we talk about this a lot when we talk about, say, mid-years finals or tests that are like used to be, kind of blocked on our calendar as like nothing else is happening. Um, how can we use as many assessments as possible that are embedded so there's learning going on while they're being assessed? And how can we keep thinking about um, our Windows and Mirrors initiative, which is really just trying to give students reflections of themselves in the work that we do and reflections from a wider scope of the, the larger world. Um, this doesn't look that great, but you will uh, we'll forward this along. Um, when we are thinking about how we build any piece of our curriculum, whether it's thinking about the standards, the activities that we do with them, the practice, or clearly the assessments, we're always keeping in mind, you know, that big picture rather than just like, what do they need the next year? Because really, you know, this generation will live long lives. Um, and so what do their 60, 70, 80 years look like beyond us? What are we really preparing them for? And so we always try to look out to say, what is it that employers are looking for? Not just the getting ready for college. Like what happens after that or for students who aren't taking that path? Um, and it's interesting every time we look at this, every couple of years, um, it's interesting more and more how these skills are moving towards collaborative problem solving much higher on, coming up in a slide, the next or the one after, let me go to that just while we're talking about it. Um, sorry, the clicker is not. Have you been clicking? <laughs> I think I'm clicking. Could you go one more, Andrew, please? <laughs> that happened to me once. Everybody made fun of me publicly, so. That is the best. Oh, that was awesome. I, you were, like, so in tune. I thought I was clicking. I just clicking. say he, he is the operations man. Exactly. I'm disappointed that they made fun of you, Frank. <laughs> it's the magic that happens. <laughs> I'm going to laugh about that all night. Um, <laughs> if I just bust out in the middle, that's what it's about. Um, so really thinking about this Bloom's taxonomy, that we want our assessments as much as possible to be really getting to that topper, that topper, that topper, that upper part of Bloom's taxonomy where we're really asking them to analyze, to evaluate, to create. Because when we flip back, Andrew, I won't even pretend to click anymore, to the slide we were on, um, these are the skills that really the employers are asking for. Um, and you know what? I don't normally read slides, but I will just read a couple because I can see that this one is hard to see up here. Um, so active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, critical thinking and analysis. So these are the kinds of things employers are saying are most important for our students. So we want to try to give them as much practice with that as possible now. Thank you. Um, so back to our special event of the four-part mini-series. Um, these are kind of the four categories that we're gonna focus on throughout our pieces. So tonight, we're gonna talk about those kind of embedded formative assessments um, and, and give you a picture of what that looks like and how that informs our practice. Um, and the next part will be on the common assessments and then kind of our benchmarks. So as you go up, these are the ones that are uh, fewer and fewer times a year. 
So the formative assessments are happening daily, regularly in the classroom. By the time we get up to summative assessments, those are typically things, funny we were talking about AP exams tonight, like things like AP exams or uh, MCAS or things that happen once a year for the students. You're so good, Andrew. It's almost like I'm just thinking it blinking. Um, <laughs> So this is the process we just, and again, this is not a one-time cycle. This is how we want to think about assessments all the time. That we establish what it is we want the students to be able to do. We design what kind of opportunities do they need to practice that. I was in a classroom today and the teacher said something that was awesome. It was middle school and the student said, how many points is this worth? And she said, this is an assessment that's like a practice assessment. This isn't one of your major assessments. And it took that whole, you could see the student and the other students, like it, um, it took it off of what's the grade and more you're doing this to learn the skill. We're working on this together. Um, and one of the things you heard from Karen tonight, I'm sure you'll hear from Julie when she comes up and everybody else, these are things we've really been focusing. I know you've heard it from Catherine Dwyer for years around science, really thinking about how we do like inquiry based and how we really get the, the students to that l level of thinking. So they're really solving and doing it. And one of the things we've been talking about as a leadership team is really engagement and what does engagement look like versus compliance. Um, and those are really two different things that we see. And the nice thing about for tonight when we talk about the formative assessments, that is they require that student engagement so you're able to assess. Thank you. Um, so our goal is to be able to show you kind of all those tiers in the seamless way that we do it. Um, we have many curriculum leaders in the district, which again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now we have them at the elementary too. Um, so people are just coming to talk about one in particular, but everybody's using this whole variety. But we, you know, we'd be in a 20 part series if everybody was uh, <laughs> sharing how they did each one. Um, and so please, if there are questions or you're wondering about, oh, does, you know, Sandy, do you also do in this area this, like feel free to ask them or if you have follow up, um, if I don't know the answer, I'll filter to the right person. We just want to kind of give you a taste of these. So just pause there before they begin for a second. Does anyone have anything about the process or questions about kind of the big picture? Yes, Mr. Brady. I snuck ahead and saw you have a number <laughs> talk, and I'm doing a PD on number talks next week. So, excellent. You can do it how you like, but I'd love to see if you want to see how the school committee can do that number talk if you want to present it to us. I'd love to hear how we'd solve it. So that would be fun. Julie does them everywhere she goes. So, <laughs> all right. So our first two peeps who are much the table. I know you have your back to the screen. So I'll put my laptop. Even though you have Andrew, you may not have eyes in the back of your head. <laughs> What do formative assessments look like? Um, these are a couple examples. So I worked with our instructional elementary instructional coach, and I grabbed some pictures. I'm so sorry to interrupt you for just a second. This is the fabulous <laughs> Lynn Fledge. <laughs> I should have said, please introduce right. yourselves. Um, and this is again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Our new um, position that is the coordinator of digital learning and innovation. Is that the proper title that we underdo? I think so. Okay. <laughs> 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 fancy. Um, so Lynn worked with Betty, who wasn't able to be here tonight. It was our elementary instructional coach, Betty yes. Boshap. So. Sorry. <laughs> no problem, sorry. So the picture on the left, for example, just whiteboards. There may be a bunch of students in the classroom holding up a whiteboard, giving an answer. The, that is one way where teachers will inform that themselves, their own instruction. So they look across, they see, you know, if there's a group of students or a certain student who is continuously correct, incorrect, um, or if it's the entire class and they're, she, the teacher is seeing an overwhelming <laughs> amount of answers that she didn't expect, that's when a teacher may have to just stop the lesson right then and there, go back, redirect it, 
um, in a different way because clearly the first time it didn't work, so it would be a differentiated method um, to inform instruction all over again. Um, and then just on the right, that's just an example. Um, that's a Padlet. Um, in real time, students can be typing in an answer to something which can invoke um, discussion and lead the, uh, the lesson to go into a certain direction according to what they see. This blink, Andrew knows what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I tried to blink. Um, here's just an example of some group work. Teachers can walk around, they can just be listening to conversations and they're assessing and that might direct their instruction to go in a certain way from what they're hearing students talk about they may just stop in ask students some questions to make sure that they're where they want to be um, academically um, which leads to one of the most important parts of formative assessment and that's reflection so it's really a huge part of teaching is reflecting upon what they're seeing in the classrooms um, and you know that's how teachers are learning learning styles of students different students learn in different ways and need different methods um, and that's just one of the ways that teachers gather that you know um, informal data you know they ask questions you know how can we make this lesson better um, and who may need it again Thank you. Um, and we broke this up a little bit. Um, I'm not going to click on all of these links, but just to give you a couple examples of elementary formative assessments. It could be a check-in simply as thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, a Kahoot is a game. That's what this picture is. So sometimes students can be playing a game on their Chromebooks and on the teacher's dashboard. He can get quickly see green, this is what students are doing correctly, and that's how they're answering correctly. Red, maybe wrong. It's giving the teacher all that information on his dashboard um, just to kind of look, assess, um, and start making plans for which direction they want to go into. Um, it could be a simple exit slip, like a post-it note. As they're leaving the classroom, they can stick post-it notes on the wall for teachers to look at. As we know, teachers can't be looking at all students at the same time. It could be a recording. So while she's working with certain students, other students could record something, you know, not necessarily to be graded, but for the teacher to look at later on to go back and make some decisions. And again, like I said, just listening to conversations during work times, having students do some self-assessments. Teachers can take notes mentally, checklists, things like that. Um, and as I said, I'm not gonna go through these all because we have other presenters who will be showing and going into a little bit more detail as we go on. But this is in your, how Seamus was able to get to the exciting number mm -hmm. talks. It's in your folders now, so you can click on as many of the links as you'd like. Mm -hmm. Hi. Are we gonna hold questions to the end, or do we wanna? Would you like to? Just ask questions as you have them, or do you want them to pause between people? Um, I think that we could, uh, I guess, if committee members have any questions right now, if if Ms. Pledge is moving on to the, <laughs> the next person, be swapping then, seats so. with someone. <laughs> I have a couple. But no, come back in. Come back oh yes, nice there might be a you few. Were so, you were so yes. close. You were, you were so there. close. <laughs> <laughs> So I heard some good things. So for the student, and I think there are many, who would say to a teacher, how many points is this worth? Mm -hmm. Can somebody talk to what are we doing institutionally to change that? Because that comes from something. First of all, it can come from home. Mm -hmm. So I've heard. Yep. Um, <laughs> but we're all in this together. But I do think sometimes <laughs> it comes from within the school building too. So how do teachers, aside from saying, that's not what you should focus on right now. When teachers are getting that kind of response from students, how are we collecting that? What are we doing with that? Where are those conversations taking place? Um, 
I, I'd say, and you guys jump in if this isn't accurate, I think we hear less of that at the elementary level and where we start to hear that more as a pattern is by middle school. Um, I think 100% it's a problem because learning for the sake of learning gets lost in that extrinsic motivator. Um, and it's also what our students report is causing them a lot of stress, right? When we look at our student wellness data um, at the middle and high school. So for instance, we can talk about this more tonight or another night if you'd like, but I would say one of our big projects to kind of combat some of that is the grading for equity. And this is where elementary are like leaders is their standards-based report card, thinking of moving to more of that kind of um, grading and showing of those grades for our secondary students as well. So it's more skill-based um, versus, you know, how many points do I get on something or what is my grade on this? Um, one of our hopes is to work more and hear more from colleges because part of what drives that is certainly the what we affectionately and not so affectionately call like the road to ivy mentality in the district about it. everybody's goal should be trying to get into an ivy which perpetuates that um, thinking around what is my grade what am i because it's so competitive and related so. to that some kids who think they have to take eight or nine ap classes right. there, there are some schools who are actually bailing on ap including one of the schools that even started AP to begin with said this is this has gone off the rails from what we originally expected right. I, and I, it gets so focused on the score for the AP versus the what are you doing in the class so, so <laughs> these were the words and you took them out of my mouth I just want to share so I'm so Andrew now <laughs> we're all you know, we're all parents around this table there's a reason I asked this question is um, when you went to your earlier slides that talked about the World Economic Forum, mm -hmm. you know, Bloom's Taxonomy, mm -hmm. I would love it when I asked my sixth grader, how was your day today? If she would say to me, I understood this, I applied this, we analyzed this, yep. I created this. Well, she talks a lot about what she, she's creative. I do hear that a lot. But what I usually hear is, I got a 90 on this. Yeah, right. I got a 93 on this. Yep. That happened today. Yep. It happens regularly. Yep. And... I'm happy for her when she succeeded, okay. but I would love it if there's a way, I, I would love it if there's a way our students can understand what Bloom's taxonomy is about and understand that that's also what they should be shooting for. Because, I mean, this is very much a conversation around our educators and our goals as a yeah. district, but wouldn't it be amazing if our kids could have that same understanding? Yeah. Um, and, and some of them I think do and I think by the time you get to high school I know many of them do but I'm not sure they all do and certainly the pressure builds and we know that from youth risk behavior survey and everything else um, it's all good stuff but you know I I believe that the administration the families the students the teachers mm -hmm. it, we're all doing this as a team and I just wish sometimes the kids had kind of that same understanding yep. that you share at the table tonight yeah. And we still have a lot of work to do for us as the, the educators, too, because certainly it's hard to break out of that mindset when students have goals that they want to get to, but it's even harder to break out of it when staff are still in that mindset, mm -hmm. right? So it's just so interesting. Like, SATs are still super important to us, and if you look at, like, all the schools in California, don't look at SAT scores anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, <clears throat> It makes us start to think about what are our goals, what are our priorities. Um, yeah, so lots of work to be done around that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I made you come back to the table. I don't know if you had any thoughts <laughs> you wanted okay. to share too. Please correct me if you hear that at elementary. I will be heartbroken, but feel free. <laughs> no, I don't. Okay, good. <laughs> and I will say I'm on the college search and all the colleges are telling me SATs are not what they're looking at anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'd say what you were saying earlier, Jen, about elementary has that sort of, um, I don't want to say a luxury that we don't talk about that, but it, we, set, we have different communities set up in our classroom, I think, and I think the elementary community tends to offer more one-to-one -one or conversational feedback as opposed to 
here's the test that you just took and there's right. the number grade or letter grade that goes with it so right. and it's the nature of our ratios right at elementary it's one to 20 at the secondary it's one to and it all makes sense why that happens because you need more content specific expertise as you go up but it does tend to silo and then you do get the bigger caseloads and you miss the opportunities for all those conversations but is that outcome driven Jen where at the elementary school we do have the standards based report card mm -hmm. and our educators need to produce a letter grade at the end of the semester for every student and yeah. how does that play into that yeah and that's part of I think tied to our bigger like grading for equity work like what what does right. what does that look like what does I mean we're not we don't have nobody has all the answers yet or they'd be doing it but I, I it's like Brene says I think it's great that we're in the productive struggle that right. we're like, examining right we right. this will be messy for a little while yeah <laughs> thank you all right I might suggest that maybe we hold our questions and continue through the whole presentation and then we'll come back to questions. Great. I like that suggestion. It's part of the transition though. I feel like I need to share that some of you know I went to Atlanta last week for a couple days and I made the mistake of just getting my hair cut real quick in a little strip mall and I heard an awful lot of things about the World Economic Forum and all the different ways that the billionaires are taking the world over and there's something about chickens and I left uh, with a lot more concern about different ways that I might die, actually. So um, I helped with that data know. today. Yeah, too, yeah, well, you know, so. there's another side to it apparently that I was not aware of, but um, it was a stressful haircut. It's not always safe. I don't safe. have a lot of hair. Not so always safe to get your hair cut. It should not have taken them that long. So that's a very important data point. Yes, yeah. thank you. All right, that's my contribution. So. I'm, I think you'll. Uh, hi, I'm Katie Malone. I'm the elementary literacy coordinator. Um, I think you'll hear a lot of similarities um, amongst all of the things that we'll be seeing tonight since we're all talking about the same topic. Um, I'll be echoing some of the things that Lynn has shared that she and Betty had put together. Um, so in elementary literacy, when we're talking about formative assessments, of course we're looking at all of the strands from the ELA standards, uh, which include reading, writing, speaking and listening, and language. Um, and during the elementary school day, there are many opportunities for students to apply their knowledge and to practice their skills in all of those areas. However, during our literacy block, teachers are regularly collecting uh, formative assessments to better know their students to help them learn and grow. Um, one opportunity that we have in the elementary literacy classroom is to take some formative assessment during our active engagement portion of the mini lesson. So the mini lesson of the workshop model is typically broken down into four like structural parts and one of those parts is active engagement. <clears throat> so during the active engagement piece or during the, the workshop model in general, but the mini lesson particularly, um, we have a model of I do, we do, you do, right? So that we gradually release the responsibility. The teacher demonstrates how to do something. They, the kids practice it together on the rug with the teacher, with each other, and then they go off and do it themselves during the workshop model portion um, of that uh, instructional time. So during this, we have a piece called active engagement, and that's typically the we do together. So this is the opportunity for the teacher to listen in on what the kids are doing and to really understand if they have taken in what has been said and if they're able to try it out together. Um, sometimes it's with uh, turn and talk. Sometimes, as Lynn had um, mentioned earlier, there could be some whiteboards, as in the picture. Um, where the kids are working either in partnerships or individually to share some of that information that they've just learned <clears throat> and to demonstrate some of that learning. Um, another way that we are collecting some formative assessment during this time is during observation. And so often teachers are using observation to gather qualitative or quantitative data about students as readers, as writers, speakers, listeners, and users of language. So one example could be during our book clubs. Um, this is a pretty natural and genuine way for our students to demonstrate their comprehension. And over a span of several sessions, a teacher can listen in to student discussion, and that teacher will also record notes about how each student is participating. So what you see here is a, um, an example <coughs> of one of the rubrics that we have. 
<clears throat> and a teacher can sit by the group and collect information either um, on it uh, you could have a sheet that is just for one particular student and the, the teacher can jot down notes about things that that student is working on or what that student demonstrated during that time um, or the teacher can use this for the whole group and jot down the child's initials and, and record some of the information about what they're doing. <clears throat> Um, teachers may also observe students to better understand their reading or writing behaviors, their participation strategies, or the, how frequently they participate, uh, and also to get a better sense, a stronger sense of student choices. For example, what books are they drawn to? Um, how are they selecting writing topics? What are some areas of improvement for speaking and listening? <clears throat> and all of these pieces help to create a more detailed picture of who that student is as a literacy learner. So observations can be planned or they may happen spontaneously. Um, they may be daily, weekly, or at any interval that may be needed. And as you can imagine, um, this, this works uh, together with a lot of our SEL pieces as well. Um, and really it gives us an opportunity, just harkening back to that um, list of the skills for 2025, thinking about some of those leadership pieces and those social skills pieces, observation can give us some information on that as well, particularly during um, the literacy block is where I'm imagining it, but I, that happens all day long when our kids are working collaboratively. So thinking about conferring so conferring is when I mean we, we all know what having a conference looks like right when people get together to talk about a certain topic parent teacher conferences um, so when we're having conferring when we're doing conferring in the classroom this is an opportunity usually for a one-to-one -one setting but sometimes it's a small group um, and when this is when the teacher is connecting with students individually and really having that opportunity to talk about who they are as a reader or as a writer Often the teacher will ask something like, what are you doing as a writer today? And that sort of helps, uh, just thinking about what Chris was asking earlier, um, it, it helps a little bit with that mentality of talking about what you're doing as a reader or as a writer, instead of like listing off the things that readers and writers do, but oh, today I'm digging into this character and I'm looking to see what, how this character is changing across the text, or you know, I'm, I'm deconstructing this word to really think about what it means and how, it, how I can better understand it. Um, so all of those pieces can be part of um, a conferring session, and usually during a conference, the teacher will um, give the student a compliment usually say you know identify something that they're doing well and encourage them to keep doing that as provide so providing them feedback during that piece and then the teacher will um, identify something that they could work on and and it's individual typically um, if the teacher starts to see and this is part of the assessment piece that multiple students are working on or could use work in a, the same area um, the teacher may pull together a small group and do it that way um, or as Lynn was saying, when you start to see like a, a theme or a, you know a, a, a pattern across your class, then you might redo or reteach um, a lesson the next day. So all of these opportunities during conferring time um, give to students that um, time to share their voice and put their voice into their work and tell you more about it. One type of um, conference that a teacher may have too is that goal is a goal setting conference, which is part of that student self assessment piece too, really helping kids to think, well, what do you want to work on? And again, it, I guess it also contributes to that grading piece too, like thinking, what do you want to work on? And let's find the steps to get there as opposed to, I'll tell you when you get there. So, um, different sort of mentality. Uh, and so then these are the, the other three that I was bringing together, I just kind of grouped them together to um, to go a little quicker, just because, you know, I know we have so many other people that want to, that also want to share their pieces tonight. Um, so some of the uh, pieces that we also use in the literacy uh, part of the day would be teacher notes or running records. So, and as, again, as Lynn said, any time that a teacher is talking with, observing with, interacting with kiddos, we're sort of, um, you know, taking those formative assessments. So our teacher notes really help us to plan and um, determine what comes next, either individually, small group, or whole group. Um, and the same with running records. With running records, we, you know, those are typically done one-to-one -one so that the teacher can better understand what the student is doing as a reader. And there's also writing running records that um, teacher can better understand what a student is applying in their writing work. 
And then partnership work is an excellent time for peer feedback as well, because teachers have modeled for their students how to do that, how to interact with each other, whether it's teachers have modeled it together, um, or the teacher has modeled with a student or, dem or given some sort of demonstration. And then students can use that feedback to, that they've received from their peers to self-assess their own work. Um, and often, excuse me, often listening to the student, the feedback that students are offering to each other helps the teacher to better understand what that student understands, right? Because when, when you can teach somebody else, so when a student can talk to, some, to their peers about it, that's a transfer of skills that show, shows us that they have an understanding of what's happening. Um, and then stop and jot and writing about reading. <clears throat> So reading is its own performance-based assessment, right? So you, you, are you gathering meaning? That's the ultimate um, purpose of reading. And so in that way, um, we can use writing about reading or stop and jots as ways to collect information about what a student has read and what they've understood about what they've read or questions they may have about what they've read. And so both of those pieces um, can be used by the teacher Again, similar to what was said earlier with like exit slips, like a little like piece at the end to, to sort of show. Um, or sometimes um, teachers will um, ask students to do a stop and jot as they go along, whether it's like questions you still have while you're going or find some vocabulary that was new to you and things like that. So um, each of those writing about reading pieces can be very informative about what our kiddos are doing in the literacy block. Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you. I'll switch with my math right. colleagues. We can have our math experts up. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie McElhaney. I'm the elementary um, math coordinator for the district. And um, thank you for this opportunity. I'm always, as Jen knows, I'm always ready to talk about it. Today, that. Julie's like, do I need to come back again another yeah. time? <laughs> You're always you welcome. Eight minutes. Did you mean 30? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, so thinking about formative assessments, as I noted on the slide, um, they are much more and can be much more than your average worksheet. worksheet. Uh, while a worksheet can tell you, know, you if a student gets the answer right or if a student gets the answer wrong, that's really all it can tell you. And when a student gets an answer right, um, they may be using a method that's not the most efficient and you'd have opportunities to help them build on their skills. And when a student gets an answer wrong, they may have a very effective, very efficient method, and they just made a minor mistake. And we've all had that experience when all of a sudden, we all know how to add, but we've all certainly added incorrectly at some point in the last, I don't know, week? For 10 the, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so today I'm gonna be sharing um, three kinds of formative assessments that are really effective and widely used in Winchester. <coughs> and they are, they center on discussions, games and activities, and interviews. So the first is um, the number talks. We're ready for this. Is it on? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it doesn't change on this one. Oh my gosh. I need to switch my seat. <laughs> no, 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 please go back. Can you go back one? <laughs> I just like I You missed that point, Andrew. <laughs> All right. So um, so the first is number talks. And number talks um, are um, routines that can be done in classrooms anywhere from once a week to every day. And they're brief, they're usually warm-ups. Um, and uh, can range in um, all kinds of math from what you might do in a kindergarten classroom through a graduate math program. Um, so the key skills that you can um, readily see in an elementary school number talk are um, the number sense and math fluency and the standards for mathematical practice. And those are all links, so if you want to get more information on any of those, um, that's available to you. So we're going to actually do a little number talk here. Yep. We're not, we don't have time for all of us to share our thinking, which that I would have to come back for, and I would love to. But um, we are going to just have an opportunity to think about a math problem and then to be able to see what some fourth graders did with that math problem. And you can see if any of your thinking comes up in, um, in what they shared. So the um, problem I'd like you all to think about is 18 times 5. And I should say that in a number talk, we don't... Um, use paper or pencil. So is this going to be something you'd be doing in your head? Please, please call on at least one person. <laughs> I think he's volunteering. I think he might be. <laughs> okay, so would anyone like to share what they got for their answer and how they did it? Yes. 
Sure. So what I did is 18 and 18 is 36. And I know I have four 18s, so two 36s is a 72. Then I added another 18 and I got to 90. Excellent. And so interesting because it is not one of the ways that we are going to see. So that was really great. You just added um, more evidence of all the various ways we can solve math problems. Do anybody else want to share away? <laughs> Go ahead. I, I looked at it two ways. I did uh, 9 times 10. Yep. Um, or I did uh, 10 times 5 and 8 times 5. Do you do 10 so times 5 so 50 and, and 8, yep, and 50 and 40, and then you, the other one was? Oh, the other one was just taking 18 and dividing by 2 and 5 and multiplying yep. by 2 and, and uh, um, doing 9 times 10 and 90. Got the 90. Awesome. All right, let's see what um, the fourth graders in this one particular classroom did. So as you can see, um, in terms of this being a formative assessment, one of, the, one of the tricks that the teacher does is they also write their, the initials, the child's initials, which is great for the kid because they love their work being shown, as we can see from how much we love sharing our own thinking, um, but also is wonderful because then when they take a picture of the slide or of the um, board, they have that as a record so they can refer back to it. Um, looking at these, there's all sorts of different um, methods that we're seeing. Up in the, in the right, you see the child was counting by fives which is um, a great effective method, not the most efficient, but it's a great starting place. So, but, but also you can see this is something where everyone can share, which is wonderful. Um, we also have on the, on the upper left, um, the person, so I would imagine that the person said, um, you know, I, I pictured it, I stacked it in my mind, or I pictured it as the standard algorithm, however they would have worded it. But if you look at it, it's interesting. Now I wasn't there, so I don't know, but in terms of formative assessment, they did the, um, the 8 times 5 and got 40. But then when people, when, when teachers um, facilitate number talks, they write down exactly what the student said. So then what it says is 1 times 5 equals 5 plus 4 equals 9. Now again, I wasn't there so I don't know, but I'm betting, because I also know the teacher, I'm betting that the teacher probed a little bit to see if the child actually knew that was a 10. And I'm betting that the child didn't, because that because that would have been reflected in the in the notation. Now, I don't know for sure, but that's that's my guess. If I had been there, I would have you know that would have been the the um, the step to probe. And then if the child if it if it wasn't evident to the child, then that's a really good indication that there's some place value misunderstanding. Um, the two middle ones in the green and the red are. Um, Similar to what Tom did, um, one is a visual model, so they actually pictured the area model in their in their mind. They broke apart the um, the eight into or the eighteen into the eight and the ten, and multiplied and then added. Um, this person over here said probably said something like, "I didn't know what eighteen times five is, but I know eight. I know twenty times five is a hundred. That's two extra five, so I can just take them those away." Yeah. Um, and then over here we have um, a method that was mentioned. I can. Oh no. No, this was different, I think. Yeah, no, that, no, no, this is different from what you had said, actually. 18 times 10, I don't know 18 times 5, but I know 18 times 10 is 180. I can divide that in half and get 90. So you can see um, from a teacher's perspective, this is a really good glimpse of what's happening in um, the kids' thinking, and much more so than if you had just written 18 times 5 on a piece of paper and had them just write down 90. Yep. Um, what teachers will do often is they will conduct a number talk you know every day for a few days even if they don't normally do it if they want to get a quick glimpse and put up problems that are similar and call on other students and they're going to end up having all this record the other thing that's really great about this kind of um, discussion is not only is it a formative assessment but it's also a chance for all of the students to be hearing each other's thinking so the person who is counting by fives you know, for them to hear, and, and, and you know, I don't know, if, I don't know if they always count by fives or if that was their fourth way of solving it. I'm not sure, again, I wasn't there. But, but if there was, if, if more strategies um, needed to be explored by any student in the room, this is a chance for them to hear it from their peers. Um, so the next um, kind of formative assessment I wanted to show you comes in the form of a game or activity. So um, this is a, um, this was, this particular one was done in a first grade classroom. Cuisinaire rods, I don't know if you're familiar with those. Um, they've had a resurgence of, um, in Winchester. We just bought a whole bunch of them, and um, they were they have been around for a long time, um, for se about 75 years, actually. And they, they sort of lost popularity or lost um, some, uh, some popularity and, and have uh, regained it. And they are, a, they are a very handy tool from, um, you know, 
preschool through through middle school. Um, so this was a first grade classroom. The Cuisinier rods, as you can see from the picture, there's 10 of them. The orange one is worth 10, and they're, they're, um, they're all based in centimeters. Um, so it's 10 centimeters, and then the white one is worth one. And so between there, you see the two and the three and the four. So the kids get really adept at knowing what, um, what they're all worth, and so they're able to use them in a variety of ways. So we're going to actually get to watch a little video. Um, the task was <coughs> to make a picture with Cuisinair rods, and I gave two constraints. The first one was that it needed to be something to do with food, and the second constraint was that the total of the rods needed to be between 15 and 70. So if you would um, click on, we will watch, um, we'll watch Molly. This is first grade. Yeah, there's all you, yeah. So that's you know just a kind of a glimpse, and, and the teacher can kind of be like, okay, count by fives. Um, it's interesting because I, I, I'm in this classroom a lot, and I know that Molly can count um, really well by twos, but if you notice there's a little hesitation, I think it's because she had landed on an odd number. Uh -huh. And so that was tricky. And that in that classroom, they do do a lot of practicing of counting by twos at this point in the year on odd numbers. So I, I you know, there was a party that was wondering if she was going to try it, but then she, was, she went right, you know, she, she knew what she was doing. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so those are up that you can watch the other um, videos at your at your leisure. And then the last um, the last assessment is um, an interview kind of assessment. And there are three. They're they're linked at the bottom of the slide. There are three that are popular in um, Winchester right now. The um, the running records is um, so oh, I should I, I'm sorry I should have said so these these um, interviews are one on one and. Um, and give the chance, give the student a chance. The questions are all around how did you do it. So the, the answers are, um, you know, elicited. But then, but then, how did you do it is always the follow up question. Um, in the for the math running records, those are all. Those are um, primarily the four operations. So it's addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And um, so the the kindergarten, I mean, the first grade and second grade um, classes use the addition and subtraction ones quite a bit. And they give you so much information because all of a sudden you realize where kids are falling down or if they do know their, they seem to know their facts, but they're a little slow. And in an interview, you find out, well, it's because I counted my fingers all the time, which is a great strategy, but also one that can be, you know, we can move out of that strategy as well with some instruction. Um, the second one is the global strategy stage. And this is actually used, um, widely, really widely, in New Zealand. And it's just, I don't know how long it's been in the US, but there are some, um, some math gurus that I follow that have been promoting it. And, and um, sure enough, I've done it with some students, um, modeled it for teachers, and it's really effective. And those are more word problems. But it also, it's, it's how did you do it? How did you do it? And hearing the kids thinking about it is, is fascinating. And then the last one is a number sense assessment. And that one is more for um, K2. And, and it's all around, number sense is, is all about your understanding of numbers, your ability to um, understand, you know, one more, two more, one less, two less, and also um, basic place value, very basic place value, um, and uh, your ability to be flexible with numbers and compose and decompose numbers and understand that inside five there's a two and a three and there's a four and a one and being able to understand and manipulate those um, that understanding to help you to be able to solve problems. So these have been very helpful, and these are these are all um, used um, only as formative assessments. They're 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 not a they're not any kind of summative. It's always about what are the next steps for the student that the teacher can provide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next number talk will be a dot one.
<laughs> well, I was going to say a, a three digit by two digit multiplication, please. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. That's what you're used to them. That's when she comes back to the next meeting. <laughs> so it is. Okay, so that's all right. If you click that one, you can get it to where you want. Oh, it's going to be a wall. So I'll just I'll just do this way. Okay. All right. Um, good evening. I'm Sandra Manugian. I am the director of uh, grades six through twelve math, and it's hard to follow Julie, but I'll do my best. Um, so. Um, when um, Dr. Ellen Emma had asked us to consider doing this, I um, happened to have a department meeting. <coughs> and so I, I asked them, I said, well, tell me what are the types of things that you do for formative assessments? And we had a running Google Doc. And they populated that Google Doc, you know, left, front, and center. And so what I have here is just a very small um, summary of just some of them. It's certainly not a total compilation of all the different strategies that they use. One of the things that I can tell you that as a result of COVID, our teachers um, rose to the occasion and learned so much um, different strategies using different platforms to, to obtain or connect with the students, especially when we were hybrid at home doing virtual learning. Um, and you're talking veteran teachers that didn't have a lot of experience with um, the internet using these different platforms. But again, they rose to the occasion. Um, we learned um, Desmos is a, a very powerful mathematical online tool that um, we use um, for formative assessments, but also explorations and um, a variety of different ways, even just within the classroom, to demonstrate um, a, a function. So um, here you see um, what I did is I split it up at middle school and high school because middle school uses certain um, things more than um, high school. For example, uh, middle school, school uses a lot of the Kagan structures on a regular basis, like Sage and Scribe. Um, rally coach numbered heads a lot of the teachers had responded in the Google form that they had used those on a, on a regular basis one of the, the emphasis that we have had over the last couple of years is to um, encourage conversations conversations with the students you know one-on-one -on -one, um, you know partners or even having them present um, we have um, document cameras so students are able to take their their work and present it on the overhead and and again demonstrate to not only um, to the their peers but also to the teacher what they are capable of doing and we can utilize that as a formative assessment uh, myself teaching geometry I have always found it valuable um, because doing a formal proof there is sometimes more than one way to do it and to have those students have that opportunity to get up there and share it has always been great so just to um, and you will see in the high school that there are some similar activities like a do now many of the times most of our teachers start with a do now activity it could be um, to reinforce um, some topic from the day before but it also could be to determine um, prior knowledge and so we use the do now's activities and um, during the classroom we use a variety of different ways to um, get interactions we could have students the, the whole entire uh, classroom um, depending upon the setup um, could get up and go around the classroom. I, I, at the high school level, we have a whole bunch of whiteboards now, and so they could be partnered up and they could do problems. And so everyone around the room can see what everybody else is doing, and we can share our thoughts and strategies, and the teacher can see those formative assessments. Uh, but getting specific to um, middle school, um, if you could go to the next one. So this is an um, an escape the room activity that a lot of the middle school teachers use. Um, it requires a lot of prior planning and, and doing out all of the um, problems and then it leads to clues so that the um, students can quote unquote unlock the clues and get to the, to the um, win or whatever you want to call it. But these are not, speaking about points and whatever, um, these are not 
graded assignments per se. These are strictly formative assessments that the students are to be using to, to determine um, mastery of skills. Uh, the next one right here is a Jamboard activity. Um, it's a representation of, it, it could be um, a part of a do now or it could be in the middle of a lesson <coughs> um, and the, the, the teacher could present you know one question, two or three questions and students will do post-its um, um, on their computers and then the teacher can look live and see what the responses are, can make a decision whether or not they want to share the responses or determine if there's more work that needs to be done so that they can respond um, accordingly. Um, the next one here is a card game that a, a teacher used as a review session and the st students were all broken up into different tables. At the middle school, um, the students can write directly on their desks with markers and um, so that's really neat. So the teacher, the teacher and the co-teacher and, um, and actually another specialist were there in the room and they each had a table with um, students at the surrounding the tables and the students were um, working on um, these problems. Each student had an index card collection of um, their rules to reference. So it was, their, it was a tool for them to reference um, different, whether or not they were like multiplying positive and negative numbers, combining like terms, solving two-step equations. So the students had um, access to them to, to reference these if they needed help. Um, and it was, um, students took turns at that was their particular problem to answer, but every student um, around the table was answering that question as well. And then if that student get it, didn't get it right, um, they didn't get the point, but the next student then could um, see if they got it right and they could get a point. So that's how they um, engaged them with a, um, to make it a little bit interesting, like who, who could win the game. But it's the idea of there was a wide variety of different topics. The teacher could see because everybody was writing on the desks which students um, were um, mastering a certain topic and which students needed help with certain topics because again this was a review activity. Um, the next one right here is um, a, a stations activity and this one was in a sixth grade classroom dealing with um, decimals, no, I'm sorry, dealing with fractions and um, each of these stations had recipes from different um, cultures, uh, different countries. And so um, the teacher was very innovative in, in bringing um, cultural awareness um, to the lesson because not only did they have a recipe of a particular country, but then also uh, supplemented it with three key facts about that country. Um, and it, you know, social um, dynamic or maybe, you know, about, uh, a geographic feature of that or whatever but um, so students had to not only take the recipe the, these were recipes and they had to um, let's say this was a recipe for four people and you had to take that recipe and um, make it for an individual and so they the students had to use um, division of fractions in order to do this and so um, students had to take away um, one interesting thing that they found about that country from the interesting facts, as well as answering the question about <coughs> the fractions. Um, so here at the high school, you'll see some of the um, um, formative assessments are the same as at the middle school, but you know, using the whiteboards, um, whether they're the whiteboards around the classroom or individual whiteboards, and they hold up the answers. Um, we do a lot of group practice in. Um, one of the things that, again, as I stated before, is that to have those conversations uh, and talk mathematically is one of the things that we're really em emphasizing. And t in terms of that, that analyzing, getting to that higher Bloom's taxonomy, that's what we are really striving for. It's, um, so in Desmos, not only can you use it as a tool for expl exploration, but you can also create your own formative assessments in it. And whether it's Desmos or Google Forms, Jamboard, Socrative, all of those are, way, are, 
uh, platforms that the teacher can create their own formative assessments. And if you, I'm not sure if you go to, actually it's not the next one, but I'll get to the next, the one that deals with the formative assessment. But um, yeah, just go to the next one and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. So this is an example of, um, uh, uh, this was an honors cl calculus class where the students were all around the room and they were finding um, the area under a curve. And um, this gentleman right here was posing because um, <laughs> they say, you know, we were using it for a picture, so he made sure that he did a pose. But this was great for the teacher. He did a great job. Yeah, this is great for the teacher to see, to make sure that they were using correct notation, but also to be able to find the area under the curve um, correctly. Um, and so she could see this. This is a, a station activity where students were partnered up and they were looking at um, the character, uh, characteristics of special uh, quadrilateral and you can see that the, one of the components here is the explana explanation so it was a written component as well not just you know these two sides are congruent these two sides are parallel but but also that the students had to write about it um, and the next one um, here this was a discovery activity where um, students were um, required to investigate the characteristics of trapezoids as, long, as well as um, special parallelograms. Here they had to do, um, use rulers and, and protractors to measure lengths of, of size, but also angles. And then they had to um, develop um, what their findings were. What, so what were the characteristics of, of um, these shapes? Um, and so this one is a summary sheet of a Socrative activity. So whether it's Desmos, Socrative, or even a, a Google form or whatever, the teacher has the ability to get a summary analysis of how students did on a particular question. Um, when you're using these, you can see it, um, when you're using Desmos, you can see it uh, um, in live time. So you even have the ability to comment to the individual student at that time, oh, did you consider blank? Uh, but then you also have it for real time later on if you wanted to look at it in a, a summary a day or two or a week later. You still have that, that data analysis here. This was a Socrative activity. And again, it was a, a, um, a review prior to a test. And so um, she could see, it was, it was a couple of days before the test, but she could see that there was um, a couple of questions where not all students did well. Um, and so that, then she was going to utilize that to go back and, and reemphasize, I need to go back and, and, and have the students examine these characteristics so that they have a, a stronger understanding of them. And so um, this is a, a fun little uh, formative assessment. It's called tic-tac-toe, but it's not your normal tic-tac-toe where there are two players and um, they are playing against each other. Both players have um, the same number of questions. So for example, both <coughs> players would have 49 questions, but they're two different sets of questions. And player one has the answers to player two's questions. And so they play off one another. And one at a time, they have to um, check the X's and O's. And so you'd have to win one particular box of the inner tic-tac-toe along with the other one. And then the, the numbers 10, 20, 40, and 30 were much more challenging questions um, that, that would have taken a lot more. So it would have been a higher level type question that the students would have to um, answer. So um, the students, um, it's just a different approach and it, it, and it just makes it fun, makes it a little competitive. Um, and so we go from there. And I think that's about all I have on that. So, are we all set? <laughs> are we all set? <laughs> <laughs> nice try. <laughs> Mr. Brady. So, I definitely think we're all set. I just want to thank you all. This is a really impressive presentation. And I, I have a good idea, which I rarely have, but I think I finally have one. I'm wondering if, Dr. Hackett, if you wouldn't mind in an, an upcoming communication to all parents attaching this presentation, because I'd love for all parents to see it 
uh, you know, I, I don't think they'll go looking for it, but if we send it right to them, then I can say, oh, did you read about number talks and Dr. <laughs> Hackett's email? And they can say either they did or they didn't. So I'd Absolutely. love love if we could do that Absolutely. because again, they, they did so much great work. So thank you all. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank I you. thought you were going to ask me about the AP score, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Just don't ask me about mine. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions for them? Or are they? Thank you guys Thank so much. Thank you so much. Totally oh, Thank you. Thank you. Really exciting so. to see all the work. Andrew, if you can just take care of all my emails, too, while you're there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, so now moving back to uh, the update on the school operations from our senior program manager on operations, uh, Mr. Andrew Marin, and also Mr. Peter Rowe, our director of finance interim. All right. Good evening, everyone. <coughs> uh, so first, Peter and I want to give a few updates to some personnel in the central office. Uh, so recently we hired uh, Nydia Aguilar, and she's serving as our administrative assistant, assisting with registration uh, initially, and then we're kind of onboarding her with some processes for transportation and facilities uh, and the coordination of those programs there. Uh, and during the time that we were interviewing uh, a few folks, including Aaron Allen, Katerina Curtin, Andrew Lazaro, and Claire Boyce, uh, all pitched in to help us with kindergarten registration, and they successfully got through about 230 registrations so it was quite the effort for them kind of learning as they went um, and additionally we hired Cheryl Stein who will be starting May 2nd as the administrative assistant within the business office uh, so she's previously at Lincoln she's there this week training her, her replacement and so she'll start with us next week Uh, and the next one, kind of just some spotlights on different departments. I know I've been here for about seven months now, and Peter, I think, just over eight. And yeah. so one of the best part has been working with these different groups, and we're definitely have a great supply of talent in all these areas here. Uh, so in food services, uh, <clears throat> uh, both Trina Scotty and Scott Berry. Uh, Trina's the director here, and Scott is the district manager for Whitson's. Mm -hmm. uh, they recently went through their administrative review with Desi, and we haven't got the final report yet, but we had an initial call with them, with Kayla from Desi uh, on the 29th, and they just kind of gave them uh, lots of kudos and kind of outstanding remarks on their performance during that assessment and the program that they offer here. Uh, they had some few uh, notes on additional training needs and policy updates, but overall it was a really good assessment. Uh, I think we expect that report shortly, I think, by next week or yep. two. Uh, this prior Monday was our full return to cafeterias throughout the district. Uh, so the teams worked hard over April vacation break uh, to clear out all of the, the COVID-19 desks and chairs and uh, miscellaneous items from the spaces. Uh, and it's gone pretty well. So we checked in with all the schools and there's a little uh, uh, a learning curve with students remembering their pin codes and so I know all the principals and teachers have been really helpful in that effort uh, and also related to food services we have a ongoing request for proposals for the food service contract in general uh, those are due May 13th and then we'll uh, work later in the month to review those proposals and select a vendor and there's a great pizza picture there from Chef Paul in the high school <laughs> <laughs> Uh, facilities, as I mentioned, here with vacation work week, uh, Pete Lawson and his team, uh, they just did an outstanding job working with a local moving company to clear hundreds of desks. Uh, and we stored them all locally on site at different school buildings, just in case we have to, have to, ever have to go back to those there. Uh, and then we've also worked to identify just miscellaneous items throughout the district that we would look to surplus or just dispose of if it's outdated. So. That's going to be kind of around two in the summer. Uh, facility rentals, we're working on a new system. And it's called Master Library, and that will kind of digitize our facility rental process and formalize more 
tracking those accounts receivable uh, and those workflows within the, the school district. Um, and we made some updates to our IPM, this integrated pest management, and working on a new plan here for Parkhurst. Uh, as the student reps mentioned, some prom and graduation updates, but we've been working with that team, uh, or I've been meeting with them weekly just to support them from the district level. Uh, and they have some really excited things planned for the seniors this year. Uh, and future items with facilities, uh, we're working on how we better review work orders that come in and some long-term planning with our facility updates. Um, and then Pete and I both uh, sit on these uh, sustainability subcommittee and energy management committee, <coughs> and we're continuing to work with those folks as we move the district forward. Uh, transportation, so we're working on a new system for online bus registration that we hope to launch next month. Uh, so we're doing some testing now and some integrations with Unipay, so we can kind of do all the math for you, kick you over to Unipay, and then you can pay, and it comes over to our student information system and tracks that data. Um, and then also working with a company called BusRight, uh, that's we've deployed the devices now onto all of our buses, mm -hmm. and we've set up all the routes since we're tracking uh, you know, from our established routes to our act, actual routes, mm. what are those variances there? Yeah. And that's helping us plan for registration for next year. Uh, and so we're looking to test it internally through this year, and hopefully next fall I'll be able to launch it to families where they can actually see where the bus is on that route, when the expected pickup pick up time is, and uh, I think they'll like it. Yeah. Uh, and then also related, we have a, a invitation for bids going out for athletics transportation. And that will be probably uh, in June if that goes out. IT and communications. Uh, uh, we've been working with IT on kind of setting up their kind of five and 10 year plan related to infrastructure and those replacements. Uh, kind of a shout out to Dr. Alan Emma, Stephanie Petito, Lynn Pledge, Katarina Curtin for all their efforts on that. Uh, it's been a lot of work and I think uh, they're doing a nice job on it. Uh, Parent Square, as you know, we launched last fall. It's like a phase one at the district level. Uh, in January, we aligned up with some PD for teachers or for schools to launch at the school level. And phase three would be um, some PD and some courses for teachers to take as we launch that in the classroom level next fall. Um, and also I'm part of the, the town's communication study committee uh, and some feedback, from, some feedback from that group is that kind of uh, residents outside of the district with the no enrolled students want to hear more about what's happening here. Uh, so we're going to launch kind of uh, a community updates test option. So uh, when our, so that group is kind of in a beta right now testing it for us. And if it's successful, we'll kind of roll it out with our new website. And anyone in the community can sign up for the WPS Digest or uh, school updates, that type of stuff. I mentioned the website, we're looking to update that in uh, our goals by June 1, and hopefully earlier. You know, I think it needs like two more weekends to get to it, so. <laughs> 24 hour day weekends. Yeah. Uh, and also, a, it's a small bullet, that's a big project about online district registration. So we have all these paper forms for preschool registration, kindergarten registration, and grades one to 12. So we want to digitize that whole process. So kind of the data entries on the, the resident side, the parent side, and then it all comes through to us, and then we vet it and go through that process. But uh, we're working on that now. It's probably going to go live in the summer. And so as we come around to kindergarten registration next year and pre-K, um, and any new students at other grades will be experiencing that system. Uh, and it's really nice. It integrates directly into Aspen. You actually access it through the Aspen family portal that you use now to see grades. Um, and it'll be translated into a few languages as well to support those folks. <coughs> uh, more IT and communications. We have uh, work internally on some cybersecurity uh, projects as well. We did receive a grant through the uh, Mass EOTS, uh, the State Department, and is for cybersecurity awareness training that a lot of folks internally are taking. And also does mock phishing emails throughout the district to test their competency uh, with that. Um, and also in progress are working on things like password policy development and uh, the IT team's done some work on single sign-on and kind of automating uh, kind of account provisioning and 
safety provisioning. Uh, we're also working on a, a PIO program called the Mass Data Hub. Um, it's a partnership that kind of Cambridge Public Schools and Cedar Labs, who does the state uh, data transmissions, have worked on. And it's a better, better way for us to route information from our student information system to other educational applications to make sure it's done secure, securely and we can audit what information is being sent back and forth. Uh, Talent Ed is a program we're looking to launch uh, to assist with our staff hiring and onboarding and kind of document management. And again, kind of digitize that onboarding experience to go through their I-9 forms and all that, those items. Uh, I mentioned the communications committee. Uh, on that committee, we did run through our draft communications plan that we had developed. Um, and that's where I got some of, that, some of that feedback about kind of community updates. Uh, but overall, they're really impressed with the work done on that so far. Uh, and then we've also made some updates internally, some new cohort reporting dashboards, uh, st strategic goal dashboards, and uh, FY23 budget presentation. And I think the last group here is safety and security. So we work monthly with the incident management team. Uh, They've been tasked with helping us review the 2019 risk assessment uh, that went that took place and kind of identify any priorities or gaps there. Um, and through that review and meeting monthly, we've made some upgrades to the high school's radio uh, portable devices. Uh, we've made some upgrades to the Lynch School and Parkhurst access control, access control and intercom systems and the policies or procedures around that. Uh, for the future, we're working on how do we manage vis visitor management across the districts. Um, so there's some ways of doing it that that group is reviewing now and we're doing some demos on. Uh, and then around uh, surveillance cameras and alarms. Uh, we're doing a pilot here at Parkhurst to test a new system that's kind of a hybrid cloud-based camera system. Uh, and also reviewing our current alarm panels and maintenance requirements. And, working through that. Uh, so I think that was really quick, but that's, that's my update. Yeah. Seven months. Yeah. Can I yeah. just, can <laughs> I just add something? You know, what, what Andrew's showing is really how important the attention to detail of so many activities that need to support the, you know, a smooth running organization, how, how important they are and, and how, what a, what a great, <laughs> commitment it was for the school committee to support the idea of this kind of position that could really um, take um, a skill set where you really understand how to integrate a lot of technology uh, and, and data, but even more importantly, work with the people in the key departments to think through, you know, what are the steps um, that we need to um, think about or what are, the, what are the small items that need to be tweaked or the areas that we need clarification. So it's really a mix of good communication as well as good thinking about how to systematize. And uh, it's often something that, that especially public organizations don't put a lot of effort into. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I, I think we're seeing and we'll see uh, benefits from it um, that really are, are due to uh, Andrew's focus on, on really making this happen. I really appreciate all the work you've been doing on this. A number of the things on your list are things that we have heard from people in the community for years that we yeah. wish this could happen more smoothly. We, you know, we wish we could just file our forms digitally that, that pl other, like uh, Mr. O was saying, people seem to expect in, you know, different sectors that don't often happen in the public education sector. So I just wanted to thank you for putting the time and thoughtfulness and actually the integrated communications that you're doing with people across town as well, because I think that's huge for, um, for if we're creating a plan like this and being the leaders in this for them to be able to um, know how they interact with us as well. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Hopcroft. Yeah, I was just going to uh, echo some of the comments and say that there's um, clearly a tremendous amount of work that you've done here and it's, and it's highly um, significant work. Um, you, you know, it's not easy to deal with lots of people and lots of systems and, and to make sure the systems and the people and everyone talk to each other. Um, and in the end, you know, 
the experience should be better for families and for children. Um, the, the data should be better and, and hopefully less manual work for the district. Um, you know, security should be better, um, both in terms of not losing data and things, but also if, if there was any kind of breach. So, um, you know, it's, it, 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 you went through it very fast and, and, I, and, I, th and I appreciate that, uh, <laughs> but, but, there's, um, but you, you covered a, a whole lot of stuff in a whole lot of different areas and it's really impressive. And, and, uh, and I feel like we've, you know, taken a, a, a giant step forward in really modernizing um, the district. So thank you. Mr. Brady. Uh, just a comment, obviously, thank you. It's really impressive what you've <coughs> accomplished in your time here. And, and this isn't directly to you. This is just more a, a comment on our processes as we think forward towards next year. Having gone through the kindergarten registration process, um, I'm excited that it will be electronic. It was certainly it's a lot a lot to do on paper. Um, I just ask that we also, as we think about that process, we think about the types of documentation we take in terms of proving occupancy or residency and, and being a little more flexible just because um, I can speak from personal experience that it, it was funny to get specific requests that don't necessarily make a difference in terms of proving whether you occupy a place. You, you can rent a place and it still can be your name on the utilities depending on how you're doing your renting. So it's just interesting. And I would say there's, there's certainly different ways to prove things, but I would say we can try and be more flexible and offer people a wider range of things. Um, in particular, when people pay utility bills online and aren't necessarily getting these paper bills, and um, some of it's much more of an old school thinking of how you would do this. Um, so I'd just like to see us broaden those parameters. Um, again, just to make it simpler and less complicated and no one likes to have to go and fish for something that maybe you know is is quite difficult for them to come across um, but again that's not to you that's more thinking <coughs> as we go forward with registration you know how do we make that as user friendly as possible yeah that's a great point point. and i think it'll be easy when it's online because then you know there is the potential to upload things pretty quickly uh, versus yeah. having to find them scan them Etc. Yep. So, thank you. Yep. Uh, Dr. Ellen Emma. Could I just add, a, like Peter said, a shout out to the creation of this position. Thank you so much. There's things that have been on our list forever. The, the yep. people power with a dedicated position can now do that. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Nixon. The position that almost didn't happen. There was a lot of conversation. Yeah. There are always <laughs> so many needs and the dollars are so hard to come by. Um, but um, I'm really glad you're here. Um, I want to say a couple of things. I, I appreciate the attitude that you bring to your work. I have the pleasure to, to work with you on whether it's a subcommittee or in just a number of tasks and you're sometimes a little tile on a Zoom meeting and it happened very recently, one of our subcommittees on Lynch and somebody said, oh, you know, we, we're gonna need to hear from the district on ABC and it'd be nice to have that in like three or four months. And Andrew just sort of quietly said, yeah, we've already met, we've had three meetings and yeah. that draft is ready. I mean, it just, he's, he's just there. <laughs> it's like ready to go and it's fantastic. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I, you're, you're very easy to work with and just bring a lot of professionalism. So I appreciate it. So two great, sort of quick things I wanna to touch on in your report, but I'm gonna go before, I, uh, maybe three, but athletic transportation. For a number of years, we kicked around the idea of having a fleet of buses, some, something on the order of a 15 passenger van, maybe something a little bit bigger, maybe coaches that would have like a commercial license and could we use that to get kids to certain competitions and practices and, uh, and sort of reduce our need on yellow bus and alleviate you know that cost burden. That has been kicked around for many years. It was explored to some extent, never really got a full presentation of the committee, but I know administration had been working on it you know, before your time. But I've heard about it though. It's come up. Yep. So is there just a philosophy about this right now in administration? Is that something we'll approach at another time? Are we looking to the yellow bus companies for full service on athletics because it's, it's too much to chew right now? Yes and yes. I mean, I, I, I honestly have concerns about um, our coaches and individual employees driving kids in a van mm -hmm. um, just from a, a safety perspective I always feel better when we get kids on a on a yellow on something yellow mm -hmm. uh, with a special license that allows them to do that um, but also recognizing that the 
in our view, in my view, and, and certainly in Mark, Mark's view, the amount of money we've been paying for athletic transportation has been a little bit higher than what we should be paying. And so um, we're going through this process and we're hoping to see better pricing um, as we go through the bid process. And if, if we don't, we'll, we may need to make some other decisions. But um, I think the market's a little bit more competitive, I'm hoping right now. Uh, than it has been, so we'll see what the bids come in at. So it was actually two RFs, so for many years we just bid out our yellow bus contracts as one RFP. We lumped in athletics with general school transportation. Right. It was two RFPs ago that it, JD actually said let's split it, and unfortunately didn't yield any benefit, but I'm still I'm glad we did it um, for the reason that you right. just said. So hopefully we'll, we'll get some good results. On the radio upgrade, IMT, are the, is that paid for? Is that going to happen? Do we need money for that? And can I ask, what is that going to cost? Uh, yeah, so it's the, the police have done some work in the high school upgrading their repeaters. And so this is the last component to have radios that could use that uh, infrastructure. <coughs> and so it was a minimal cost. I think it was $2,500 that we were able to pull out of IMT budgets that we have. Okay. So I was asking because we just over the past four years we've Funded been deliberately upgrading meeting. repeater stations and yeah. police and fire radios because of F some FCC changes and never occurred to me to ask about the IMT folks that right. are part of that. So right. I, I'm right. sounds like this is not a lot of money. Yep. Um, then the last comment I want to make, which is a bigger one, just with respect to that risk assessment report, school committees have some obligations and opportunities to understand risk assessment in a district and that certainly qualifies for an executive session conversation right. there was a really in-depth report you know town-wide some of those rec so I, I will say I don't think the committee has really ever seen that full full report but I know some of those recommendations some of the recommendations from the consultant in my mind seek to accomplish a certain goal right. and some of the goals I think really are informed substantially by policy so you know since it's in your report a good example is do we do should we have a collective thinking or a policy around visitors so and and so how does recommendations from risk management tie into policy subcommittee work right. um, and I just want to extend again maybe it's like a summer activity because I, I think it's going to be a big conversation but I, I think it would be very helpful for the school committee to understand some of the, the findings and the recommendations under that risk assessment because um, uh, as I think some of you know the police chief came to Capitol last cycle and sought some funding to initiate some of this and was basically told no by Capitol because those phase one requests re were really seen more as operational items so developing pickup and drop-off procedures that I as far as I know we already have so just kind of some nuts and bolts about how we do things um, I think maybe we could find a, some time to talk about yep. Um, yep. just before things go a little too far and we start spending a bunch of money agreed I mean I think is that is clear and as cryptic as it needed yep. to be well it's okay. clear and I also just I think it's, it's a critical it's a great time to do it because we've had so much turnover here in the central office and key positions um, and also at the police department right so yes. um, so we've Andrew's work we've Andrew both Andrew and I met with the police department Andrew's been pretty much constant contact what I also appreciate about appreciate about Andrew is that he is looking to standardize as much as he can. So when we talk about access controls, we, I believe we have, what, two, two systems, two different systems for access control, three, three and a half. Um, you know, to the extent that we can get on one system, it may, may not be possible, uh, but it just is much more efficient for everybody. Um, Munis is another good example. The town has upgraded uh, to the new uh, interface with, with Munis, and Andrew's been working with, uh, with Peter on that, with Stacy and the town, just to try to kind of leverage more of those functions. Talon Ed was a software package that the district had bought uh, under Lori. Um, I don't know how long ago that was, Lori, but pre COVID a little bit. Just before. And it is, yeah, and it is being used, but it's just the amount of. Um, capability in some of these software packages that cost tens of thousands of dollars oftentimes school systems use that much of it um, because they overbuild it first of all right this the companies overbuild all the time but to have the dedicated position to be really able to maximize those uh, capabilities of those software packages and as Peter pointed out just the amount of contact with the people who are who are on the receiving end of all this stuff who oftentimes get left out in the discussion about how to implement this stuff is just you know it's just really important so um 
yeah. So it's a lot of work in a, in a few months, and um, you know I think I think that the front facing side of this for parents as consumers when we're talking about the transportation registration, online registration, the all website. those things, yeah, yeah, they're gonna yeah. see and the um, they'll you know yeah. it'll be a it'll be a nice school year to enter into um, with some new opportunities for parents and just to make things easier. Yeah, I think that's the really, ex for me, that's, I think, the really exciting thing, just to see how you've taken many of these processes that I've seen over 10 years <laughs> in the district. And I remember the labor-intensive kindergarten registration papers and carefully filling them out and going and finding utility bills. Um, but um, it's just exciting to me to see how you've taken these processes and you're streamlining, uh, streamlining them and um, I think we can see evidence on that in the, our website and through Parent Square, and I'm just excited to see the rollout and um, how it will expand going into this next year. So thank you so much. Seven months, so exciting. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you to Mr. Rowe and to Mr. Marin. Um, we will just move on through the chair report. Um, I just have a few items here. We are very busy with town meeting, uh, through which just started last night, um, and we'll be continuing through May. Um, we'll be taking up the financial articles in May, or next week. Um, spring activities are also picking up, as we heard from students, and as I think you can see from newsletters um, and hearing from our teachers, there are just so many activities and events that are going on at our schools. So I think it's an exciting time for um, parents, guardians, families, kids, teachers. It's just uh, springtime is great, but busy. <laughs> um, it, uh, Mr. Brady, you had looked up some information for us on the kindergarten orientations. Yes, just for my friends on Friday, <coughs> Morocco is at 9 and Lynch is at 9. Vincent Owen is at 9.30, doing their own thing. And Lincoln and Ambrose are at 10 a.m. And that's this Friday for kindergarten. And I would say... Correct me if I'm wrong, but even if perhaps you're still working on your registration papers, you'd be welcome to come. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We would, we would want a, you at orientation to so yep. figure out the paperwork, right? Great. So I, I hope to see folks there. Unfortunately, I can't be there, but uh, I hope everyone who can make it can make it. Um, and I guess last of all, I'll just make a quick plug for a program that I just r received some information on from the Winchester Youth Baseball and Softball. Um, they are starting a Bambino Buddy Ball program for children with disabilities who would like to participate in baseball. It's basically pairing volunteer players um, and students who are already participating in our in some of the baseball and softball teams with children with disabilities. Um, it is a free program and it is running six weeks beginning May 7th. So just for information for the community. Um, and with that I will turn it over to our superintendent, Dr. Hackett. I am all set. Thank you. This okay. is a full meeting, and it was great to hear, and I appreciated the questions that you asked, and it was a lot of information. Uh, thanks to Dr. Ellen Emma and the team that she put together. Um, I think this is a really important discussion, so it's just good to have a school committee that wants to hear about the educational issues, and it feels kind of good to be able to do that tonight because we've been doing a lot of other things up to this point that have been, you know, necessary, uh, driven by, you know, new turno turnover and staff and COVID and all the other things that we've been going through. So it, it, it felt good, especially as we go into spring. So thank you. Uh, future agenda items, we have our upcoming school committee workshop. We're still working on uh, the facilitator for that and then nailing down a date. Next meetings, uh, we have May 10th, May 24th, and June 14th, all at 6 p.m. Those are the regularly scheduled school committee meetings. Um, as Dr. Hackett had alluded to at the beginning of the of our meeting tonight, um, we also will have some pre-town meeting meetings, the next one of which will be this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. over in the high school. 
Um, and I would say that we should, we will also be having the same 6.30 meeting before next Monday, <laughs> this town meeting. So please just plan on that for the moment. And so just yes. sorry, before, because um, <coughs> I know we're approaching adjournment, I just wanted to, we had a, what I found to be a important public comment from Amy regarding the Dibbles data. And so I know we have an upcoming presentation on benchmarking. So uh, I'm just gonna recommend that, you know, at that presentation, we take a look at some of that data. Uh, I think that's, it's been a request that's been made by a lot of folks and it's a request that I'm making as a school committee member. So I just wanted to put that out there. I'm not gonna make a formal motion or anything, uh, but know if it's not there I, I may make a motion in the future because it it's important and we need to look at it thank you thank you very much um, yes mr. Nixon I just want us to keep on the radar <clears throat> yes open enrollment and school choice yep yep, yep. Mm -hmm. and I just given the lynch project that's coming mm -hmm. that we may to find it may be helpful to talk about school choice you know in more than one meeting but really defer to Dr. Hackett in terms of, you know, your thinking on that. And if there are recommendations you might bring to us and you School want our choice, feedback. Mr. Nixon, or the open enrollment? Excuse me, open enrollment. Yeah. Did I, I just do it you again? you did, yeah. yeah I just wanted open. to be clear because blah, 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 blah. very different. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. Well, although, since Lynch isn't here yet, that also would factor into yeah. uh, school choice. But yes, um, so there's some deadlines coming for those. Yeah. Especially because of COVID, you know, we haven't really I don't think we, I don't think we've done um, open enrollment um, in a couple of years, right? Right. So, right. so it would take. I mean, there's a little bit of there's some community education involved if we're going to do that. We're right. a little out of practice. There was a time where it was just more of a regular thing, and we always had to explain it a little bit, but. And there are years we didn't do it. That's right, but at least we always talked about it. And there was, right. you know, if you were interested as a, in a, as a parent, there was probably some parent at your school you could talk to and ask about it. So it's been a little while, so yeah. we're a lot of practice on that. that good practice to get back into. Okay, uh, next item of business is executive session, and I will need a motion for the purpose two to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Winchester Education Association, because to do so an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the committee. So, so moved. moved. Second. Thank you very much. And the committee will be adjourning in the executive session as we will not be returning for any further business.